And then we are live. Welcome to Cognitive Rampage Podcast. Hope you're taking care of you. Hope you are living your Cognitive Rampage. I am excited to learn some things today. I hope you are too. Just a brief intro. The man is already in the room waiting, but this is Mr. Paul Check. A world- Cheers. Uh, cheers. <laughs> cheers to you too, man. A world-renowned expert in the fields of corrective and high-performance exercise, kinesiology, stress management, holistic wellness, 30 years. Paul has been doing this with an integrated approach to treatment and education, has changed the lives of many clients and students, their clients, by treating the body as a whole system and finding the root cause of the problem. Paul has been successful. Well, you have been successful where traditional approaches have consistently failed. I cannot wait to get into that. He is the co-founder of the Czech Corrective Holistic Exercise Kinesiology Institute based in California, USA, and the PPS Success Mastery Coaching Program. My God, I'm out of breath. Prolific author of books, articles, blog posts, and thank God we got you on the podcast, brother. Thank you. I'm honored to have you on, man. My pleasure. That must be an old bio. I've been doing this for 35 years. Well, 35 years. Well, it doesn't matter. I, that is a long-winded bio, and I have uh, I have been requested to have you on this show, brother, over and over and over. Is that right? Well, thank you to all the people that were requesting me, and thank you for inviting me. I love sharing. Yeah, I um I found you through an old friend that uh, will remain unnamed on this podcast for various reasons. Um, <laughs> Secret agent? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, let's just say we have our differences, right? Oh, well, that's okay. Uh, that's part of life. <laughs> that we do, but uh, yeah, man. So tell me your story, Paul. Uh, walk me up on, well, the 35 years, what got you into this? What turned you over? Where'd you come from? What's the childhood, the stories? Tell me it all, man. Oh my God! Well, how long have you got? I mean, that's yeah, a long story. Four hours, brother. We have done five, six-hour podcasts. So okay, good. Well, we'll roll for a while. I'll try to keep it brief because a lot of people that have listened to my many, many podcasts have probably gotten bored of hearing the same intro story. But um, I'll veer us off. Don't worry. I will squirrel us off many multiple avenues and lanes. So don't worry about that. Okay. Uh, I was born in Los Angeles, and then my parents moved. Uh, to Idaho. We had a pig farm for three years. And actually, my dad at that time got the record for having a a sow that gave birth to, I think, 24 piglets, which was the Department of Agriculture record for the most piglets. So that's one of my memories from that time. (laughs) That is that is the first I've heard. And probably because I've watched too many gangster movies. But one (laughs) thing I mess with is a guy that owns a pig farm. Yeah, exactly. As I think Ben... Uh, Greenfield was telling me that the guy that gives them the toughest competition, these, I uh, forgot the name of the competitions, they're hunting and running and it's its like a race, but he said the guy that's the baddest ass guy in the world, the world champion is a farmer and he said this guy is not to be messed with. And, and I know exactly what he means. My dad was a farmer and he was the toughest, meanest son of a bitch I ever met. I told the drill sergeants in the military when they used to be acting badass i said you haven't seen shit you couldn't last a day on the farm with my dad he'd kill you (laughs) none of your games bother me at all this is just light work (laughs) but uh so then we my parents decided that they wanted to raise us on vancouver island they had friends there and so they applied for uh to immigrate to become landed immigrants of canada and in that process we moved to cottage grove oregon and they wanted to crossbreed sheep to produce black wool. My mother's a spinner and a weaver, and my dad had a degree in all agriculture. He, my stepfather, my real father died when I was eight. And then my mother remarried, and, and my stepfather was a special effects man for Universal Studios, but he also had a degree in agriculture and, and loved farming. And he used to be the manager of Will Rogers Ranch in Los Angeles. And uh, so we moved to uh, Cottage Grove, Oregon, specifically because there was a lot of um, sheep farmers in the area that my father had tracked to have uh, rams that were producing black offspring. So they would, you know, the sheep would have black wool naturally, which is a prized possession. So their plan was to move to Vancouver Island and they bought a farm there, uh, a 140 acre farm, which we had a sheep farm and we um, bought a carding mill which is a wool processing mill and it literally filled a huge barn it was a huge like plant and so we had i think about 110 sheep if i remember it varied from time to time but 
So my father and mother specialized in crossbreeding sheep to produce black offspring, and they got quite a high population because they selected the rams that were known to do that. So my mother joined the Self-Realization Fellowship. She was a Christian, and she joined the Self-Realization Fellowship when I was 12, I think. And that's the, the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Some may know him as the author of the Autobiography of a Yogi, which is an excellent book. And the audio version of that's narrated by Ben Kingsley. It's fantastic. Awesome voice. Yeah, so uh, what happened was is I got to heal my Christian confusion by going to temple meetings with the monks. And for, for the first time, I could get my questions answered. And I had, even as a kid, I had a lot of deep questions. And actually, as a kid, going to a Christian church, I used to get really nervous because I saw so many inconsistencies in what they were claiming and telling us that it made me scared that adults were that <laughs> unintelligent. <laughs> and every time I tried to ask questions, I just got shut down. But the monks were awesome. And as a segue, Adam, do you know what your name means that, uh, from the big biblical perspective? Uh, what was it first man? No, well, that, that's well, from often the earth, from the earth. Yeah, it means of the earth, creature of the earth. And in Arabic, it means creature of the red earth, of earthly slime. Oh, all right. So, you can leave out well, the slime part. <laughs> well, you know, that's okay, because remember the lotus, which is the symbol of the crown chakra, grows in the mud. So, um, you know, everything we see around us as life comes out of that mud, doesn't it? That's wild, man. I, I'll take it, because uh, you, you could say I, I came from some, some mud in the background of my life. Yeah. I, well, I, you know, when I read your bio and I realized what your name was, I go, well, that's very appropriate. He's living the life of an atom. And Eve means life force in, in Greek, in the Greek translation of the Bible. So Adam means of the earth and Eve means life force, that which enlivens everything or spirit or the Holy Ghost is the life force. So people think that Adam and Eve were the first two people, but really that's a very big confusion. It really means <laughs> yin and yang. <laughs> Yeah, this, we don't want to explain it to you scientifically. You won't get it now. Perhaps you'll get it in hundreds of years or thousands of years later. So let me just give you this metaphor. <laughs> yeah, it, you could just study David Bohm, and he he does a better job than most of describing. And I won't go into that; it'd be a long segue. But so anyhow, I got to spend time with the monks, and my mother spent twenty four years very devoted to Yogananda's teachings, and she went to India for advanced initiations three times. Um, when I was 15, I spent the summer with the monks in summer camp learning meditation techniques and Yogananda's living philosophy, which was uh, very, very helpful and very, very healing and gave me a good grounding for the kind of tumultuous, wild and crazy childhood. My father was really not a very pleasant man. My stepfather, that is not a pleasant man to live with. He was very violent and very physically abusive. Mm. And uh, had no concept of children. He only saw them as slaves in adult bodies. So mm. um, I had a lot of childhood stress because I really felt like I was just being controlled and had no freedom whatsoever. And it really was intense. But uh, I can uh, I'm vibing with you there, man. I can relate to an, to an upbringing similar like that, man. I can I can hence the hence the questions, the wondering, the why, trying to figure out why somebody would be a certain way, think a certain yeah. way, what our points. Yeah, man. I'm, how old were you? How old were you when you took off uh, to be with the monks? Well, my my mother started the Self Realization Fellowship when I was twelve, so we used to travel to the weekly uh, week weekend temple meetings. Like people go to church, we went to temple. But when I was 15, this, my 15th summer is when I went to spend the summer with the monks. Wow. And that, that really uh, gave me a toolkit that I probably wouldn't have survived without, honestly. Um, you know, just there, there was times in my life that were so painful and so intense. And my brother committed suicide when he was 34. Holy shit. And, uh, you know, then my, my father died when I was eight, and then my sister's little boy drowned when he was three, and my grandparents died. You know, a lot of us go through these death things, but when you're a kid and, and you're That's a lot, man, that's a what, lot for an eight for that age. To, man, yeah, and so, um, so really, what a long story there. You know, I, I hated school, I, I found school just ridiculously boring, and uh, I did really well in the classes that I enjoyed, and the teachers were good. I, I got A's in auto mechanics, I got A's in physical education, 
I usually got B's in biology, but in things like math and social studies and related, I, I just found them wickedly boring and barely passed if I did pass and never did homework because it just, I hated it. I actually never read a book till I was 22 years old. What book was it? I was actually in the army at the time. And I remember the day I finished reading my first book in my life, cover to cover, I jumped up. I was on a bus coming back from an army uh, running event. I used to be on a lot of the army teams for athletics. I represented the army in triathlon. I was on the army boxing team. I was on army running teams. And there's a lot of military competition. They had a big competition at the Pentagon and we were on our way home from the competition. And the book was, new, uh, was um, Rudolph Valentine's book. I think it was called Nutrition, A Holistic Approach. Um, it's about 400 page long book, but it was the only book I'd ever picked up that captivated me. And because I was an athlete, um, a very serious athlete, I, and I also come from a background of motocross racing and kickboxing and boxing and Taekwondo, uh, which is what gave me the skills to ultimately fight my way under the army boxing team and become the trainer of the boxing team. So anyhow, I, I did all sorts of jobs when I left home, my girlfriend got pregnant. I had my first child when I just turned 18. He was born two weeks after I turned 18. And so I just went hell bent for leather. Neither of our parents had any money. And I just, I just, you know, my father, as, as mean as he was, he gave me the grit to just handle about anything, you know? So I went off in the world and I did really well. I mean, shit, when I was 19 years old, I was making probably I don't know, 40,000 bucks a year working in logging camps and on drilling rigs. And, and I spent all that money raising stock cars. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, uh, that's funny. I, I, I've got into racing recently. I've uh, hosted shows for NASCAR and stuff like that. I, I was very new to it. I mean, it's amazing, right? How out of that darkness, out of that, that I mean, I can see what has shaped Paul now for mm -hmm. you, the third person. I can see what begins to shape a person like that because I can see people where they, Look at all the things you've done, how hard you train, what you do, the questions, and where people go, man, what makes a person like that? And it, it, it's the things that you have been through that have made, I mean, and you very nonchalantly pulled out that silver lining of, you know, going through the father I had created this opportunity for me to be able to go out in the world fearlessly and take things on. I figured, you know, I'd never seen a man that scary or dangerous in my life. You know, my, my, my stepdad's a 6'4", 220, ex-professional rodeo rider, uh, the best shot I've ever seen. And I, and I was an expert shot in the military, and my dad is noticeably better than I am. He could shoot the balls off a fly at 100 meters, this guy. I mean, he was dangerous as hell with a weapon. And uh, one time when I was a kid, actually, he painted a picture. We used to have a lot of wild dogs that would attack our sheep, and so my father went through a uh, we lost a lot of money because we were raiding, ra raising very expensive thoroughbred type sheep for breeding and stuff. And a lot of the neighboring farmers had these dogs that they didn't contain and they would go out and what they would do is just attack the sheep and rip them to pieces and they would just leave them dead in the field all mangled. And so my dad actually had so much problems with us. He got the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in, in our hometown to give him a license to kill any dog that was attacking our sheep. So we had loaded rifles pretty much in every corner of every building and around the house, probably about 20 rifles and pistols or whatever you needed because it was such a big problem. But one day my dad was target practicing. He paint, he hand drawn a picture of a German shepherd in life size on a piece of plywood. And he carried that thing a easy four or 500 yards away. I mean, so far away that I couldn't even barely make out the shape of the dog and he took one of his rifles and fired three rounds, bang, bang, bang. And I walked down the field with him, and those things were within a cluster of about three centimeters right through the dog's heart. Yeah, that's sniper and stuff right there. Oh, yeah, he's definitely that kind of guy. In fact, one time, to give you a little taste of the life I lived, um, during mushroom season on Vancouver Island, you know, magic mushrooms grow a lot because there's so many cow pastures and things, and they grow pretty heavy there, and people come from all over the world to – to pick mushrooms, but they ruin farmers' fences. They leave gates open, let animals out. You know, they act like idiots, right? And one night we were eating dinner and it was, uh, it was quite, it was, the sun was down by then, 
but we could hear the sound whenever people climb on barbed wire fences, they squeak. And we heard our, we had border collies that were trained to herd sheep and the dogs were going crazy. And we, all of a sudden we heard the sound of barbed wire squeaking. And my dad said, holy shit, someone's climbing the fence. So he uh, gra grabbed one of his rifles and ran out the front door and he, and I went with him and you could just see there was uh, three guys and they were trying to hand our sheep over the fence and loading them in their truck. And my dad took one of his rifles and unloaded an entire magazine of rounds into that van as it was driving away. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah. 15 rounds, man. Bang, 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 bang. I'm like, oh my God, dad, aren't you worried about killing him? He says, if you want to fuck with my sheep, you, you can, you can meet your maker. <laughs> Ooh, I mean, it's your money that feeds your kids, your family, your life. Yeah. So I mean, he was that kind of guy. Right. So, you know, I got the picture, man. I, I swear. I think your dad, and my dad may know each other. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're probably cut from the same cloth, but, uh, so, you know, I, I long story there made short. I, I found it. Um, you know, Vancouver Island was very much driven by the logging industry. That's the big industry there. And we were going through a bit of a crisis because the Japanese had been buying up wood in large amounts when the prices were low. And then they started reselling it back to the market. But because their um, because their milling plants are so much more efficient and their 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 system of wages. They don't have to pay the workers near as much in the system. So they could actually take our wood, buy it from us, mill it, and sell it cheaper than the, we could sell it. So it caused our economy to collapse. And the whole economy went down. There was like 17.5% unemployment, which is quite high. Yeah. And so it was hard to really get decent work. But being an American citizen, I, I thought, well, shit, I just got to go anywhere. I got to go to get money. And a buddy of mine had gone to work on the fishing boats in Florida. And uh, I just happened to get a call from him one day and said, man, it's tight as hell for money right here. I got to figure out what to do quick. And he said, shit, there's lots of jobs on fishing boats down here. So I sold off a race car and a couple of engines. And, you know, uh, I put about, uh, you know, 20 grand in my pocket and said to my wife, I'm going to go get us a, uh, get a job and find us a place to live. So I jumped on an airplane, flew to uh, Florida, flew to uh, Miami and then drove down into the Florida Keys where my buddy was at. And within one hour, I had a job on a fishing boat. I love and that so place. That, that's like my second home down there, man. Spear fishing. I mean, I've been lobstering since I was six, seven years old. I mean, that's that's Marathon was my home, man. Yeah, well, that's where I was at is Marathon, Florida. <laughs> that's my home I, down there. Man. I used to be a mechanic in the Bonefish Harbor Marina. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, that's oh, I love it, man. We're going uh, going down here soon. Dolphin season's kicked off, so yeah. So the the guy that owned the bonefish, the fishing industry was just brutal. You know, I after a season of fishing, I worked my nuts off and long, long shifts without sleep on a gill netter. And then when I got paid, you know, they take their what they call they give you what's called the cruise share, which is right a rip off. They take gas, fuel for the boats and everything. You just get shafted, right? So I worked my ass off. And it turned out I was making $2.50 an hour. And I said, oh, my God, I can't do this. You know, the Sun Belt's famous for ripping off workers. But uh, I said to my wife, I said, I've got to I've got to see if I can use my mechanical skills. So I started doing odd jobs, fixing people's cars, because when I was young, I went to automotive and industrial repair school, uh, which is a journeyman school to be a mechanic and work on hydraulic systems and vulcanizing tires, kind of like a full training program to work in the automotive and industrial industry well i mean if you've been a race car driver i mean that that's it i mean i've i've got to know the short track and a lot of short track drivers around i mean there's not a whole lot they can't fix yes well that's very true and the guys that were on my pit crew were absolutely amazing in fact one of my uh guys on my pit crew used to work for uh daryl waltrip oh yeah and uh he was his body man and and I, I actually set three track records in my rookie year as a race car driver, which was quite exciting. And um, you're going to say something? No, I'm just the, go on, man. I'm just like the, I'm watching the resume and the of the experience stack up, man. I mean, that's it's it's how I try to live my life every day, every single opportunity you can. Some of my friends sometimes are like, how does this happen to you, Adam? How do you get here or get there? And I'm like, I don't know. I just, I don't settle for anything. I'm down to try anything twice. I may have done it wrong the first time yeah. you know, and move around. So as I listen to the story, man, I just, 
I smile at people that live like that, man. I mean, and and I would say it comes from the pain. It comes from the shit. I think maybe we tried to run from or understand younger and, and venture out and down to do whatever. I mean, man, I don't know. For me, it was like I could fucking die in a week, you know? So I, yeah. was like, I got to try something. So, yeah, forgive me, man. Keep going, man. Well, you know, for me, it was, is you know, when you have a child, a switch goes off and yeah, if you have, you know, a couple of testicles hanging from your crotch and a few brain cells holding hands. And I realized that, you know, my, my, my parents didn't have the money to support me, neither did her parents. And so, you know, being raised on a farm like that. And, you know, by the time I left home, I could weld really well. I could fix equipment, work on balers, tractors, you know, being on a productive farm is you, 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 you know, you have to, learn practically and effectively or you just you're dysfunctional right you're now you're a codependent <laughs> you're a sheep yeah you're one of the sheep yeah, yeah. yeah questions of whether to keep you or not and my dad kills sheep so i knew to keep <laughs> keep fucking going and uh so <laughs> you know so what happened is as i once i was down the florida keys and, and it was just hard work and so i'm working in the bilges of boats i mean as a mechanic being in the bilges of boats breathing fish guts all day and sitting in slime i'm like and hot as hell down there and you know you have to use a flashlight down there to see a lot of boats don't have lighting in there and i just like i i lasted about four months and i'm like okay this is enough i i i'm pretty good at taking punishment but this is not my future and one day I got this card in the mail, Uncle Sam wants you. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder what would, I wonder what I could do in the military. So I went down for testing and my, and the owner of the Bonefish Harbor Marina was an ex fighter jet pilot who fought in Vietnam. And he said, Paul, if you join the military, the secret is choose the job that has the longest amount of training because generally the more money the government invests in training you, the more you're worth when you come out of the military. Good point. So I said, okay, good. So I went down, I took all the tests and they actually, the recruiter said, look, if you just go get a two year degree, an associate's degree, we can train you as a helicopter pilot. You scored so high on all your tests that you literally could go right into pilot school as a warrant officer, but you have to have an AA degree. I said, I am not fucking going to any kind of school. I hate school. What's the best job you can give me? Well, it turned out it was aircraft, aircraft weapon systems repair on for Cobra helicopters, which is very, very technical. I had to go to math school for two months just to get my math skills high enough because when you're in school, you have to do everything longhand. You can't use calculators in case of a battlefield emergency. And there's no, if you lose your technology, you got to be able to do it with your head. Wow. That makes sense. And then it was 44 weeks of electronic school. Then I went through jump school to enter the 82nd airborne division. And then when I got to my unit, which was the 82nd combat aviation battalion which was a zero one priority unit which means they're the first one to go to war so it's on high alert all the time and if any helicopter breaks you work non-stop till it's fixed and if you don't have the parts you go to a neighboring marine base or military base and you take the parts because it's by priority order whoever's you know highest in the order to go to war and so we had to be vaccinated to the roof because we had to be anywhere in the world in 24 hours so it was quite an interesting experience, but the point I'm making is these guys didn't freaking exercise and I'm like getting out of shape like crazy. I come from an intense martial arts, boxing, kickboxing, motocross racing, you know, heavy, intense athletic background. And all of a sudden I'm working long shifts. I got addicted to coffee because we're working like 36 hour shifts on these helicopters. And it's very dangerous because I'm controlling the weapon systems. And so I had to start drinking coffee. Let's not calibrate that wrong there, Paul. We're gonna make No, no, yeah. You know, it's very dangerous. And they had they had had a history of some pretty bad accidents. You see, you have to wear the heads up display system. In the Cobra helicopter, the gun, the machine gun, which is a a, a gatling gun that fires, you know, it'll put a bullet in every square foot of a football field when the helicopter's flying at 350 miles an hour. Ooh. One pass over a football field, it'll put a bullet in every square foot of that football field. So it's like 800 rounds a minute or something like that or more. And it's a huge gun. I mean, it's, you know, massive gun, but the barrels are like seven feet long. And it, wherever you're, wherever the pilot looks, the gun tracks off his eyes. It's a very elaborate system. So it's not like sighting a normal gun. If the pilot looks at something, he just pulls the trigger and it'll shoot whatever he looks at. Whoa. But what happens that's is- wicked. Whoa, that's in, wicked. 
what happened a couple of times is guys would fall asleep while they were wearing the display because we were working such long hours. And when their head dropped down, the gun bellows are so long that if it goes all the way, because it'll point straight down at the ground, you see they're flying above you in a battlefield situation. It flips the helicopter over on its side, which is, oh. you know, you can, you can find yourself filling sandbags for a very long time if you flip an $11 million helicopter over. Yeah. Holy shit. So that led me to just going, oh my God, I went to all this training. I got to get the freaking hell out of here. This is killing me. So I said, I got to get myself onto the boxing team. That was my plan B. I chose specifically to get to Fort Bragg. One, because I wanted to be a paratrooper. And two, I knew that the army boxing team was there and I trusted myself that I could fight my way onto the boxing team. You can only get on if you beat somebody that's on it. And at that time, it was the third ranked boxing team in the world. Um, only been beaten by Cuba and Russia at the time that I was there. And um, so I, the problem was I couldn't fucking get down to try out because we were working such late hours. You had to schedule a tryout. And almost every time I wanted to try out, the only hours they did was in the middle of work and they wouldn't let me go. Plus you're trying to find time to train to go down there and fight no, at the same time. There was no time to train. You know how I did it? I just, every time I went to the toilet, I grabbed onto the fricking pipes that were on the ceiling above the hallways and stuff, the drainage pipes. And I just did as many chin-ups as I could. I just dropped down and did push-ups every time I could. I did sit-ups every time I could. I did jumping jacks. I mean, they probably thought I was the most physical fit guy in the toilet they ever saw. <laughs> and then I would get up real early in the morning, even when I was exhausted, and go out and run and do wind sprints and stuff like that. Because I knew I was going to have to work my ass off to get a spot on the boxing team. But the grace of God was that it was right about that time. It was every year they have what's called an inspector general's inspection, which is where the general of the 82nd Airborne Division does a very intense inspection of every soldier, your work environment, your sleeping environment. And they choose the out of, uh, out of 16,000 soldiers, they choose six exemplary soldiers. And each of them gets a three day pass to go do whatever the fuck they want. And so the only way I could see I could get to that boxing team is I had to win that damn contest. And I did. I got selected as one of the six outstanding soldiers in the 82nd Airborne Division. I went right down to the boxing team and I knocked out some Puerto Rican guy in the second round. <laughs> and that led to me um, fighting on the team. But the first thing they noticed is I was the only guy that could fight as hard in the third round as I did in the first round and I didn't eat all the crap they were eating. You know, I was eating very skillfully because my mother's very knowledgeable on nutrition. My father's very much a kind of a natural guy. You know, you know my dad's a survivalist. He's like, like what I saw in your resume. You could, if you were alone in the wilderness, he'd be a good guy to have with you. He'd probably fucking kill a grizz grizzly bear with his bare hands, that guy. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I fought on the team for a while, but I also represented the Army in triathlon at the same time. I was actually one of the few athletes ever known that could represent the military simultaneously in two sports because this is a very elite level competition. So I was actually doing triathlon training while I was fighting on the boxing team and the coaches were baffled. So were the athletes how I could do that. And I said, well, you guys just don't know how to train. You don't know how to eat. You go out at night and get drunk and you, you just live like morons. So my company commander, I was the first soldier ever in aviation to be in the newspaper all the time, winning all these athletic competitions. And my company commander was fucking betting lots of money on me. And he came to me one day, he called me and I thought I was in trouble. He says, check, he says, I want you to win the army triathlon. I got a lot of money on you. And I said, okay. He said, if you want to leave the boxing team to train full time, I need you to win this event for me. And I said, well, I'll, I'll do it because I, I was a good fighter, but I was too, I, I wasn't as polished. You know, I didn't start boxing until I was 12, but a lot of the guys on the team started when they were like six, seven, eight years old. And we had guys on the team that 19 years old had over 300 sanctioned fights under their belt. Yeah. That's a lot of ring time. It is. And so I was more of a Ray Mancini fighter. You know, I, I could hit you hard enough to scare your mother and I could take a punch. So I just wore people out and beat the shit out of them. But I knew I was never going to turn pro with that fighting style. So I wasn't afraid to leave the boxing team. And so as soon as I told the coaches I was leaving, they immediately said, don't go. We'll turn you into the trainer. Your job will be to teach us how to condition the athletes, teach them how to eat, 
what manage were, the gym. What were they doing? Like, what kind of training? Because when a lot of people think about military, well, probably nowadays, but n- not at the time, you would think, all right, that's the most optimal training. What did they do? Oh, or my what? God, man. It was so fucking backwards. They would, one, they had no concept of nutrition at all. They lived off McDonald's and crap. They used to feed the fighters in the corn in the during fights. They would take a teaspoon of honey and feed it to the fighters when they're in between rounds, which would just take your blood sugar up through the roof and drop you like a rock. They used to be they the guys used to not make weight. So what would happen is like the night before a fight, they'd be with full sweatsuits on, sometimes oh. two sweatsuits head to tail in the sauna, skipping rope for hours, and they would just be wet dogs by the time they weighed in they had nothing left in them they take these things called piss pills that stimulate the kidneys and they would urinate till they were in severe pain it would just dehydrate the hell out of them uh, they didn't know how to use weights they were actually scared to death of weight training because so many boxers had do- ruined their boxing career by lifting weights like bodybuilders and it made them slow as hell and so when I started implementing weightlifting strategies and all the different things I was doing from hydrotherapy in the swimming pool to mixing track work with boxing, shadow boxing and mitts, I would take them to the track and have them do intervals to purposely bring them into lactate threshold and then train them to fight in that state. And a lot of the stuff that I implemented, I just, it was a sort of a mix of common sense and creativity. I was going to ask, where, where was, where did it come from, from for you? Well, you know, I grew up on a farm and I was put in a lot of situations where my father basically said, you better get the job done or dot, 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 which means you'll probably go to the hospital. So I just really learned how to focus my mind. And then the meditation with the monks helped me kind of learn to really stay on top of it. And I think I just have a natural ability to recognize patterns and see where things should fit. And so I learned to just be, uh, you know, because I was raised in such an intense environment, I learned to focus under extreme pressure. And so I think, you know, my mother's very creative. She's an amazing sculptor. She's got sculptures and museums all over the world, and they're all over my office here. And she's a craftswoman. And so I think I picked up a lot of creativity from my mother. My grandfather taught arts and crafts or uh, crafts to the deaf, dumb, and blind in the Los Angeles school department. And he was also a, a, a very skilled stone um, worker and jewelry maker. And he actually worked on one of the space shuttles to make special insulators for some of the wires that had to deal with high heat. So on my mother's side, there's quite a lot of brain power and creativity. And, on, and my, fa- my real father was a professional drag racer and a competitive dancer. So I got the kind of the mechanical aptitude and the wildness that now expresses itself as a man that has two wives. But uh, um, I just had this natural ability to work under pressure and figure things out. And so I became the trainer and I became the first person ever to implement massage therapy for the fighters. I just, my grandmother, when I was young, I had asthma quite bad and my grandmother was the only one that could get rid of the asthma and she would do it by massaging me. And somehow my child mind recorded the sensation of being massaged and how she did it. And I'd never had any training in massage, but I inherently knew I knew how to do it. So I just bought some books and started studying it and doing it on the fighters. And it had such a radical difference in their performance. That's a huge thing now. You see corners doing it to the fighters in between rounds. You see them doing that massaging on the arms, the legs. Man, that's a that's a thing now. Yeah, well, I I took care of thirty boxers, and including James Bone Crusher Smith when he went the distance. Who's the first one to go the distance with Mike Tyson? And I was doing therapy for him at the time. And so he actually used to be on the Army boxing team. That's where he grew up. Is right in that same gym that I worked in, and. Um, So what happened was, is the team doctor was an osteopathic physician and I learned how to take care of acute sports injuries from the medical perspective from him. I implemented my diet, massage and exercise strategies and hydrotherapy and rest and things that I was studying in sports medicine books, anything I get my hand on that seemed logical, I would try it. And then um, when it came time to get out of the army, I knew that the best thing that I could do is become a sports massage therapist because that would give me a license to practice. 
and I wanted to work with all the triathletes in San Diego and I wanted to live in San Diego because I really miss Southern California. So I actually did some research and found that the best sports massage therapy school in the entire United States was right in Encinitas, California, which turned out to be the place where a guy that was my counselor in summer camp who I had gone and worked for on his landscaping crew one summer lived and he was building a big house and had a trailer that he wasn't using anymore. And he said, I could stay there. So I took my wife and kid and we drove all the way from North Carolina, had everything I owned in the car and, and a few dollars in my pocket, went to sports massage therapy school. And I started working for a chiropractor who was a competitive marathoner that had chronic uh, Achilles tendon problems that nobody could figure out for him. And I said, I'll, I said, I'll bet you I can figure it out for you. And he took the challenge and I straightened him right out. And he said, oh my God, you're doing stuff I've never seen done before. How'd you learn that? And I said, well, I just listened to your body and do what it tells me to do. And next thing you know, I'm working at his office and I worked there for almost two years. Then I got offered a job at the largest physical therapy clinic in San Diego with 24 athletic, uh, 24 physical, 21 physical therapists and athletic trainers. We had our own surgical center and 13 orthopedic and neurosurgeons. So I got to do lots of surgery time, cadaver dissections, and I got to trade knowledge with physical therapists and athletic trainers. And they learned a lot from me and I learned a lot from them. Then I went and owned my own physical therapy clinic with a partner who was a highly skilled physical therapist. And then the insurance game was just such bullshit. We couldn't make a living because they wouldn't pay us anything. You know, we'd bill them 150 bucks and they'd send us 24 bucks in the mail or something. So I went from making over a hundred grand a year doing my own therapy on the side and working in this large clinic to making like $16,000 the first year I owned a clinic. Second year I made 24, 27, the third year I made 40, but we had to work so freaking hard and I couldn't do what I, I had to stack patients up to the roof in order to make enough money. And I hated that model because I felt like I was ripping people off. I couldn't connect to people and really deal with their issues. It was breaking my heart. So we, him and I both agreed that we had to get out of the system. So we sold our clinic. We, we put 40,000 into building it. We sold it for a couple hundred grand and got out of the business. And I started the Czech Institute. And I just, while I was a therapist, I traveled all over the world looking for the best doctors and the best therapists to learn hands-on how to deal with all sorts of stuff from Feldenkrais training to shoulders to necks to backs to infant development to temporomandibular joint dysfunctions to necks to you know whatever knees I just traveled I, I did over 5,000 and I think 5,100 hours of workshop training with the best doctors and therapists in the world I actually got the equivalent of classroom hours of a bachelor's degree traveling around the world, tracking down the best people. Well, I'd say you got more because the, the hands-on approach, I mean, doing it live, learning hands-on, th this is far exceeds reading a book and listening to someone lecture to you. So uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you, you know, they already figured out what the bullshit is. So you just get right to the meat and potatoes of it. And that was my style of learning. And that's really a lot of what I, how I run the Czech Institute. It's a synthesis of all the stuff I've learned in my career through all my research and working with complex cases. And, you know, I've been a consultant to uh, militaries, to Olympic committees, to, you know, professional rugby teams, to many professional sports teams over here and basketball, football, hockey, um, universities. Uh, I've, you know, I pioneered the use of the Swiss ball in the gym. I was the first guy to ever do that. I, I studied the Swiss ball, the European methods. I bought books that were in, foreign languages and studied them just by looking at the pictures and just took my knowledge of anatomy and the Swiss ball and developed a whole system and then integrated that with weight training. So I pioneered the whole concept of that you see now as a Swiss ball in the gym. Oh yeah. This, the, this, the thing now you, you see it slammed up against walls. You're seeing it used for all kinds of different um, variations of balance work. And yeah, uh, I, I mean, yeah, I did not know that. Yeah. I'm the guy that pioneered that and, and many other, I've got, I've got uh, several patents. I'm an inventor and I've invented exercise and calibrated rehabilitation assessment tools for accurate assessments of various functions in the body. And uh, so I pioneered a lot of things. I won't bore you with all that, but uh, so really all that kind of life experience and then clinical experience and working with 
everybody from people with cancer and grandmothers and old people to the best athletes in the world and combining that with kind of the spiritual underpinning. And I've also had a very, very deep, deep quest for metaphysical knowledge. So I've, I've, you know, I've got a massive library. I've been studying all the great spiritual teachers for many, many years, my whole life. And, uh, I became a medicine man and spirit guide through the Native American Council about 2005 or six, and I've probably done about 400 uh, plant medicine ceremonies, both uh, for my own healing and for running healing ceremonies. So I have a lot of experience with that. I studied with Master Fong Ha, who's a, a, a legitimate master in the ancient lineage of Tai Chi masters and Qigong masters. He's in San Francisco. so. He really taught me the principles of Tai Chi and Qigong. I took training in medical Qigong. And then I developed what I call a system of working in. And so I popularized the concept of working in, which is the zone exercises in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, and other methods that I taught because I could see athletes were totally and utterly burned out all the time and they didn't have any inner life and they didn't know how to rest properly or use their mind to work with their inner systems. So Eat, Move, and Be Healthy was the first book in the world to allow you to customize your diet and rehab and exercise program based on the specific needs of your own body. Um, so I think- The customization is missing from so much. I, sorry to cut you off. The, that's right. It seems like uh, through the journey of it all, man, there's a, an underlying of humility there, willingness to learn, question what you thought would be, because so many practitioners, and pick the field, yeah, psychology, it doesn't matter, no nutrition, pick it. Well, they, they, they seem to grab onto a thing and say, this is how you do it. This is the way yeah. you do it only. But even in, in, in all your travels of, of learning from this person, this person, it was well, kind of what created the method of what you have. But there's an underlying humility there to, to learn, to be taught, to question yourself along the way, which I think is missing from, a, if not a majority uh, of practitioners or uh, fitness people, health people in, in any realm. Well, you know what helped me was... I didn't want to just be a standard massage therapist and rub bodies. And I didn't like being a personal trainer because I just can't stand counting to 10 for people and getting paid to babysit people and being a rent a friend. Um, <laughs> so, you know, what I did is I built my whole career by going to doctors and therapists and saying, send me the toughest people, the ones that when you see them on your schedule, you go, oh shit, not that one again. And I quickly developed a reputation for being able to help the unsolvable cases. But as my reputation grew, so did the complexity of cases that were getting referred to me literally from around the globe. And so I would get people and with all the knowledge I had at any given stage, there would be people that were so damn complicated. I had to do tons of time in the re research. Actually, I used to pay my son uh, a dollar an article and I got him a, a pass card to the UCSD Medical Library and would buy him cards with with like fifty dollars worth of printing or a hundred bucks worth of printing on them, and I'd pay him a buck an article, and I would send him with a whole list of research articles. Because this is before the internet, and he got very proficient in the library. Some days he'd make a hundred bucks and buy skateboards and all stuff like that. And so my son and I were quite a team. You know, he was the go get it, and I was the research it. And uh, so I would actually take cases and I would look at all the things that they'd done. I mean, some of these people had multiple two inch thick medical files and they'd seen, you know, 40, 50 doctors and therapists and were getting worse and worse and worse. And a lot of them were like on the edge of bankruptcy. They'd spent so much money. I've, I have found that Paul, that the almost, the more you go to the doctor, the sicker you get. Well, that's pretty classic. And so, that was also one of my challenges because a lot of them needed to be referred to specialists, but they had no desire to see doctors again. So they'd say, I'd rather take my chances in your hands. So the, what I'm getting to though, is I would look at what was going on with people and I'd say, okay, you've seen 15 chiropractors, you've seen three neurologists, you've seen five physical therapists. It's obviously not likely to be something in that camp. So it, what it would turn out to be was inflammation in the guts or a heavy metal poisoning or teeth that were rotting and, and causing reflex alterations of their um, energy systems and glands and organs through the meridian pathways because all the teeth are linked into meridians. And so what I'm saying is after many years of looking at these tough cases and then going and doing mountains of research, I would typically find articles, for example, that would say, uh, 
like I would look at what's called differential diagnosis. And I found, for example, that if someone's got a, a backed up liver or liver stress, the liver reflexes to the right shoulder. So a lot of these chronic shoulder problems and rotator cuff injuries are actually coming because the liver was sending its pain to the shoulder, which causes the muscles in the shoulder to be, behave like they're in pain because the brain can't tell the difference between referred pain and actual pain. And the stomach refers to the left shoulder. And without going through every one of the organs is actually in charge of the muscles on the same uh, arteriovascular channels, which is what your chakra system show you. And so everybody kept looking at the body like it was a musculoskeletal machine, like a robot, but it isn't. It's regulated by many higher order systems. And in fact, I developed a system called the check totem pole by about, oh, probably around the year 2000. From all my research, I'd found exactly what systems have the highest influence of control over what systems below. So I built a totem pole to show my students the order you have to go in evaluation. So for example, at the top of the potent totem pole is the psyche itself because you can, you can kill yourself. So it'll, that'll override breathing. The next highest order system is respiration. And then the respiratory system actually controls every system in the body and it will sacrifice any system to keep you breathing. So people, for example, that have breathing pattern disorders have chronic musculoskeletal problems because if their body cannot optimize breathing, for example, when people keep doing too many sit-ups and crunches on a floor, it adaptively shortens their abdominal muscles, which pulls their rib cage down and their head forward. Well, when your head's down and forward, you don't have extension in the thoracic spine. So you get a volleyball player or a baseball player or a swimmer, anybody that has to put their arm over their head and it gives them an impingement syndrome, which then leads to a rotator cuff injury, but everybody keeps treating the fricking shoulder. And then I would say, well, shit, this is coupled with doing the wrong exercises. So I actually invented calibrated instruments to identify exactly what the structural alignment of the body was. I used the standard physical therapy model of goniometry, which is measuring joint range of motion with calipers. And then I would look at their diet and then I would do all this research into differential diagnosis. And sure enough, when he starts studying books on differential diagnosis, it would say, well, you know, a migraine headache can come from the following 10 things. And most of them were things that nobody ever talked about. Shoulder pain can come from these other areas. So I started then researching books on visceral reflexes and I started you know, looking at the chakra system and, and I started looking at the teeth and I looked at the, um, you know, I looked at basically the, the glandular system and, and the uh, hormonal pathways and how they're influencing physiology digestion. Then I looked at the gut microbiome and fungal and parasite infections. And I looked at heavy metal poisoning and food additives, preservatives, colorings, emulsifiers, and I found that most of the shit people are eating is completely and utterly fucking their glands, organs, and guts up and setting them up for fungal and parasite infections. And everybody keeps on trying to exercise them harder or more or send them to yoga classes. And like, you're in the wrong goddamn zip code for your problem. So I kind of pioneered a very holistic integration and a very comprehensive system of assessment, which led to me developing a curriculum through the Czech Institute that takes about seven years to go through the training I developed because you do a block of training and I don't want it to be like a university. You come, you do a block of training, then I want you to go practice it for six months until you have natural mastery of it. Then you come to your next level of training. So to do that system takes about seven years to really learn the system and apply it effectively. And it includes everything from the musculoskeletal system to all the systems in the body to uh, the psyche and to looking at things like um, attachment syndromes from childhood, traumas, um, shadow work, dream work, um, shamanic practices, medicine work, uh, you know, so it, it's a fair bit, but the, the journey has taken me into situations where people were so complicated, I had to reach into these other systems and so like you can find answers to problems in shamanism you cannot find in traditional medicine or even allied healthcare. Like you can study Chinese medicine, but there's not stuff in there that's in shamanism and vice versa. So, you know, I studied Chinese medicine quite a lot and I studied a lot of these unusual systems and I learned how do they work? I studied Feldenkrais therapy, Alexander therapy, um, you know, 
many different systems, Qigong, Tai Chi, uh, various uh, systems of diet, whether it be Ayurveda and, and sort of basically what I did is I built a system and I ultimately synthesized it down into a 10 step model. And the 10 step model is one, what is the person's dream goal or objective? Because if, if they're not clear on what their dream goal or objective is, they're never going to be inspired to do the work, to heal themselves, to make the behavior changes, the diet changes, the lifestyle changes. So you're just pissing in the wind. So first you got to find out what they love more than they love their crisis. I, I often quote, um, well, my, dog, my dog has decided to uh, <laughs> run underneath and take the camera out. Oh, I was wondering what that was. I, I saw something moving and then all of a sudden went screen to black. I guess like it's a lightning discussion we're having. Yeah. No, my dog decided to uh, have a little fun there. And uh, Penny. That is funny. That is too That's funny. Right. That is the first time that that has happened out of, I don't know, five years of podcasting. <laughs> Well, that's all right. Oh, man, that's my girl, Grace, man. Uh, love hey, it. Yeah. I, I was a paratrooper. One of the first things they teach you is improvise and adapt. Oh, that's you'll it. Die. We make it comical. That's it, man. I didn't mean to uh, to cut you, but I do want to go back, man, because the, the the fire hose of information there, when you when you talk about the differential diagnosis, right, we're, we're such a, a reactive um, medicine, right? We have, we have reactive medicine, even reactive mental health medicine, right? You go to the yeah. psychologist when something is wrong. You go to the doctor when something is wrong. Like you said, they treat the shoulder. You know, I, I, have often argued that we tend to treat the symptoms rather than try to find the underlying problem of most things in mental health. And you kind of saw yeah. this on multiple levels, on a spiritual level, on, a. Uh, an energy level, nutrition level, right? And most people are just looking for that one thing. They go, okay, this hurts, so we must fix that, or or it's got to be something else. And seeing, like you said, seeing those rare cases that you had, I think perhaps gave you that opportunity because let's face it, most of the doctors and practitioners are not going to take the time to to look up what you did, to go where no. you did, because they are a specialist in this. That way, uh, what's Maslow say? Uh, is it Maslow? Uh, everything, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Um, yeah, well, if all you got in your pocket is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Yeah, exactly. And these are the practices that you see. That's what you see happening uh, with, with, well, doctors, dentists, you name it. Uh, it, it's always something in their wheelhouse uh, unless uh, they get referred out or they call you a hypochondriac and send you on your way. I mean, how do you, I mean, it's so hard, right? But where so many people look to say, okay, what am I supposed to eat? How am I supposed to work out? What am I, we look for this one thing that, you know, yeah. this is how you do it. Part of that's, part of that has to do with two key things. One is the fact that uh, if you study, Ken Wilber has a book I read many years ago called A Brief History of Everything. And um, it's interesting because I listened to it on audio, but then when I got the book years later, the book had changed. So I, I don't know what happened there, but in this audio cassette series that I got off of him, you know, this is like 15 years ago, he gave the entire history of our, our Western education system. And he showed how it was developed by plantation owners and what they used to do is they would take the kids into classrooms and because they knew what jobs the kids were going to be doing, they trained the slaves in what became our education system to follow orders exactly and to never be creative and not change anything because they were using assembly line type processes or picking cotton and then that goes to this or you know, building a steam engine or whatever it might be. So actually our whole education system is the product of plantation owners that programmed the children to, to follow orders exactly and not think for themselves because they didn't like them not doing exactly what they wanted them to do. And that grew to be our education system. So unfortunately, we don't have systems that teach people how to think. We have systems that teach them what to think. Mm. Then we have this. You very, can say that again, Paul, and I'd be behind. Yes, that should be a shirt that says something like that. Agreed. Yeah, well, um, Mark Twain has a comment that I show in some of my slideshows, and it says something like, uh, um, it shows, I have a picture that I had an artist do up, and it shows people graduating with their little graduation caps on, and I have a picture of a welder welding their head shut. And, and, I, and Mark Twain's comment was, don't let your schooling get in the way of your education. And I was like, amen. 
And so um, then you have this issue of religion and 85% of the world population claims religious affiliation and we're in a Christian culture. And then we have the whole issue of the priesthood and how they had to, how they dominated and controlled people, taught them, you know, for example, in Christianity, divining of any kind is, is considered the act of the devil. But look, I used to work on drill rigs and I was taught as a kid how to find water. So the priest took away any abilities that would have been natural to us at the time so that they could control everything from where you found water to when you planted to when you could trade, what you could trade. So we come from this system of total control by the church, which used to also own the militaries and be the government. Not much has changed. The Vatican's the richest, most powerful corporation in the world to this very day. Um, so what I see is that we really are suffering from a mix of the influence of organized religion and corporate driven education that's not designed to teach people to think for themselves, but to follow orders to fit into a system that ultimately just makes a few people in the world a shitload of money. I mean, you know, over 50% of the wealth is owned by 2% of the population in the entire world. So it's, it's very there and, and me not going to school for very long and hating being told what to do. I quickly realized that a lot of the people that had PhDs and master's degrees could not think. If it wasn't in a book, they didn't know what to do. They could recite you. We could recite what yeah. we read and, and tell you what someone else found. You know, it was funny, man. When I was going through my master's program and I was learning about like, if you could see the wall behind me, it's it's some of the, the greatest minds that I, you know, I, that I found in psychology and behavioralism. You know, I got uh, uh, Dr. Albert Ellis, Carl Jung, Aristotle, Marcus Aurelius, right? Some of these some of these guys. And I was as I was going through it, I. I First, I went that route because I wanted to answer questions, right? Why somebody would do this, why I would think this, hell, why I did certain things that were shitty. Just trying to figure out the human psyche of why we do what we do. And and as I went through it, I remember pondering, I'm like, we're studying all of this little small group of people that yeah. came up with these theories. And I thought, well, where are the new people? Where, where yeah. are the new Freuds? Where are the new Maslows? Where are the new Ericsons? Where are those new guys and, and girls? Where are they at? And that's where I kind of came up with, you know, I, I came up with transrational structure behavior theory as a, a different mm -hmm. kind of total integrated approach to treat people with addiction and other issues. But I remember sitting there going, well, why can't I be one of those guys? Or, you know, why can't I come up with the theory? If I, so that's what I did with my book is I went to the the behavioralist who said, oh, it's all behavior. The, the, yeah. The, the environment. Yeah, yeah. He's actually right there, too. I went to all of these, you know, I, from Freud to all of them. I said, well, Ellis, I love you, but it's maybe not all cognitive. It, it is what we believe and think, but it's what you do. It, it's what you eat. It's, it's the environment you're around. It's all of these things. And, you know, I was able to kind of back out and go kind of like you on a, a smaller scale, more on a, a psychological level. Mm -hmm. and back out and and see the that whole world and man I, I tell you my first journey down the cognitive rampage this is five years in the in the show now when i first opened up that pandora's box dude i couldn't sleep at night <laughs> when i started what i'm like oh my god what are we doing you know uh, what is this people don't understand you know i wrote this paper one of my thesis was uh i, I said we all died the day marketing was invented you know that yeah. it, it can control your shape of, of what it is, what what the world is, what we're supposed to be. I mean, it, it's it's amazing. And so when I listen to your story uh, on a much grander scale of how you're able to open up to everything, dive down each rabbit hole, but still have the humility not to latch on to one and say it's this way. Period. Well, you know, like Ken Wilber says, there's a little truth in everything, and I think every approach has its merit, but. But I teach my students, which in my system is multidisciplinary. I have everybody coming into my system from every branch of the healthcare profession and even truck drivers and carpenters that are sick of doing their work and have been healed up by a Czech professional and say, I want to do this too. And so uh, I teach them to graduate a level as a level four. You have to write me an essay on how to refer to over 18 different health and allied healthcare practitioners so I know that you know where you've hit your limit of skill, but you can recognize, they're trained to recognize who needs Feldenkrais therapy, who needs a biological dentist, who needs a, a union psychologist, who needs a behavioral psychologist, who needs a physiotherapist, who needs a chiropractor, an osteopath, et cetera, because um, none of us has the knowledge. So, you know, what I did is 
studied the basics that were necessary to know in many different fields. And the basics are really the foundation of your knowledge. And then through clinical experience, I was able to stack more specific knowledge in each of these different areas. But also because I made a habit a long time ago of working with many different professionals and sharing clients with them. And I learned how they saw things. And I was dealing with so many chronic pain patients that nobody could figure out. And some of them were very tough for me to figure out too, that I started a, a, a multidisciplinary group for pain management. And I invited the 13 best doctors and therapists I could find in San Diego from different branches. And we would meet every month and we'd each bring a case that we we're having a hard time with and we would present it to the group. And we would get 13 different viewpoints on what to do. And it was a tremendous learning experience. It was mind blowing. And, and so basically what, one of those cases, sorry to cut you. I'm interested in one of those cases. because That proves the point right there that if the 13 best in the, in the area come together all with a different approach, imagine that's the patient. You know what I mean? That has went to yeah. one, and got one, went to one, got the other. I mean, this is, this is echoes what people experience every day. Can you maybe walk me through one of those, those, uh, I don't know, Dr. House, <laughs> those, one of those cases that maybe, uh, was presented either now or just sometime in the past. Well, I, 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 I was, um, basically what happened is I used to be in charge. I developed the massage therapy department in this physical therapy clinic because there was so much work. I couldn't handle it all. Once they saw how powerful, properly done soft tissue work was, I ended up with a, a building a team of four massage therapists. And one of them also worked part-time at the UCSD um, hospital, University of California Medical System Hospital in the uh, headache and stroke department. And the professor and chief of that department, John Rothrock was a very intelligent, very open-minded guy. And so she was telling him about the work I was doing and he was very interested. So he came down and met with me and he said, could I refer you all the cases we're not getting results with? So we'd get a lot of these wild migraine patients and head trauma patients and all sorts of weird stuff. But one day I, I, I happened to be working with a lady that had intractable migraine headaches and no drugs or anything would work for her. And one of the doctors in the group, James Weber, who was a genius of a doctor who says in the group, he says, I gave up on, on drugs 20 years ago. I use nutrition to heal people. And so, uh, we, I was presenting this case and he said to me, um, have you noticed that migraine patients have a real tendency to eat a lot of sweets? I said, absolutely. They're like sugar monsters. He said, that's because they're usually, they've either got a dysbiosis or a parasite infection or they have inflammation in their gut and they can't absorb protein from their food. And it turns out insulin is the best carrier for amino acids across the blood brain barrier. So what he said is that whenever you have a migraine patient, you, you need to analyze carefully how much protein is in their diet and whether or not they can absorb it, metabol digest, metabolize, and absorb it. And so he, for example, then triggered me to start analyzing. And sure enough, I found most of these migraine headache patients were single mothers that were divorced, that were almost always working in some kind of a job where they were competing with men, like a lot of them were lawyers or legal assistants or dental hygienists or people like that, but they were working their asses off, stressed to the nines, going to aerobics classes early in the morning or late at night and eating what I call a rabbit food diet. So when I started working with some of these, a lot of them had gut inflammation and problems like that. But when I started working, um, I worked, I found a company called Swiss Pharmaceuticals way back then that was producing um, organic whey protein that was specially modified so that the um, dairy wouldn't trigger immune reactions in people. So it was a kind of a hypoallergenic. It was very expensive. It was about $89 a pint, but it really worked. So I could take some of these people with very sick guts and feed them a bioavailable protein source. And lo and behold, their micro my, migraines disappeared. And so there's one example wow. of what happened in a group like that because I had practitioners that had found the edges of their profession and had to do what I did, they had to start jumping into other camps to grow. There was a couple things I wanted to say, though. The other two issues we have, you were talking about, you know, marketing, and, and which is brainwashing. In my research on brainwashing, and I have an entire course on how to use the science of brainwashing to heal yourself of all your unconscious programming, which is PPS Success Mastery Lesson 2, self-management, which is available at ppssuccess.com. And 
In my research, I found documents showing that the Catholic Church had mastered brainwashing by the 8th century, and they've been perfecting it ever since. And so there you see the influence on the public through religious programming. And the other issue we have is that we have, in our medical system, we have what is called a treatment model. So you go to doctors and therapists to get treatment. Now, Adam, if I say, Adam, I'm treating you to dinner tonight, who do you automatically assume is going to pay? You're paying. Oh, <laughs> I see what you're doing there. Yeah. Okay. So what happens is we've developed an entire culture that is conditioned to go to doctors and therapists with the idea that they're selling their problems. If, the, if, you, if I pay you a hundred bucks, then I should leave without my problem. You're supposed to take it away from me, which means there's no consciousness of the fact that they've got to participate in that process. So the entire check system is built on what I call a coaching model. I teach my pay my students, you only do for the client what they cannot do for themselves. A client can't effectively uh, correct a sublux joint, for example. If their atlas is sublux, someone with skill has to do that. A client can't mobilize maybe their own SI joint or they may not have the knowledge to figure out what parasite infections they have or how low they are on cortisol or where they're at with their cortisol rhythm or cortisol DHEA ratio. So the things that we have to do, we do, but the things that they have to do, such as deciding what is happy making in their life and choosing to do it, getting to bed on time and getting some sleep, eating food that's of high quality and going through the process that I teach of learning how to listen to your body and identify what it is that your body wants to eat, not what's on television, not what in diet books, not all the horse shit that people keep telling them is good for them because most of that shit is bullshit. So the point I'm making is the Czech system is a coaching system. We put the onus on the client to take the responsibility to make the diet, lifestyle, and behavioral changes necessary to bring them into a state of homeostasis and balance. And that's why it's so important to have a dream. And so, um, you know, when you look at these factors, you can see why people don't heal because they're actually conditioned into a system that's highly profitable and it's a disease maintenance system, not a health care system. And so, Preach on, brother. Pre <laughs> Woo! I mean, this is the cognitive. Sorry, I'm interrupting. Go ahead. That's right. No, so just to give you the quick overview of the 10 steps, after years of research and synthesis, I needed to simpl simplify it down because even my most advanced students and instructors were in a paradoxical situation because they would say, Paul, you've taught us so damn much that we have a hard time knowing where to start with people. We gather so much data and most people are so screwed up. We don't know where to begin. So I worked with my soul and said, I need to synthesize my own internal process that I use intuitively and put it into a system that others can use. So a long story made short, I went into meditation and my soul began dictating to me and I took notes and I came up with this very simple system. So one, what is it that you love more than your crisis? That's your dream goal or objective. If you don't identify what they love more than their pain, you're never gonna help them. Well, the, the, pain, the pain becomes part of their narrative. I've, I've often have yes. said that, you know, it, it may be painful, it may be sad, but if it gives us the narrative, it still can become your purpose, that it will define you. It becomes the story you tell. And I'm the person with this disease. And that is how I'm yes. defined. Yeah, right on. That's a hypochondriac. Um, a neurotic is someone who acts irresponsibly when they should be acting responsibly. And that, that we have a lot of those out in the world. And, and that's a child. That's the archetype of the child. That's someone who hasn't grown up yet to accept responsibility for the gift of life and the gift of a human body. So one is what is your dream goal or objective? And if you can't identify that, I teach my students to identify what their nightmare is because the nightmare is the one thing in a person's life that if effectively resolved will free up the most energy that can be used for healing or creativity. Love that. I love that. That's so the first step, I've heard of that, Paul. I've well, heard a lot of practice, a lot of practitioners angles and stuff, but I, I like that. What is that, by the way, that you're inhaling? That's um vaporized, uh, real nice, clean tobacco. I've got a bunch of organic and, and, and chemical, not chemical free tobaccos, and it's a herbal mix. I got about a 50 or 60 organic herbal mixes that are smoking mixes, but yeah. I use a vaporizer. 
And it's just a nice kind of, you know, head clearing. Neurostimulant, yeah, nicotine. Yeah, a little, yeah, and you don't get too much nicotine because the vaporizer only goes to 450 degrees. Cigarettes burn at 800 Fahrenheit and nicotine's an oil-based uh, chemical, so it takes a lot of heat. You're getting about, I guess, about 30% of the nicotine. I can smoke this stuff all day and go off and I feel a little sleepy for 24 hours, but then that's it. No, you know, there's, so there's not any chemical addiction beyond just a day of recovery. Yeah. But, sorry to throw you off, but you were walking through the steps, man. I, I love that nightmare idea is defining that. Then when you see it, a lot of people will see what that nightmare is. Sometimes isn't that bad when you front it like that. A lot of times it isn't. And in our culture, the number one nightmare I've run into is financial mismanagement. People are, you know, research shows that 98% of Americans are two paychecks from bankruptcy. So if you look at the chakra system, that's what I call a root system on fire. Their whole sense of survivability is triggered. So if you then look at your reptilian reflexes at the brainstem level, you, you, you I, I researched Paul McLean's triune brain theory many, many years ago. And he shows that at the brainstem level, which is where our real survival reflexes come from, we have three primary reptilian drives. One, am I safe? Is my territory safe? So the first thing a reptile does is check to see if its territory, which is its hunting grounds, are safe from predators that want to eat the same food. Once it's safe, then it says it's time to eat. So then it hunts. And once it's safe and it has food, it procreates. So when you look at our survival drives, anything that threatens our sense of safety will cause a huge stress reaction in our body. And whenever we have elevated adrenaline and cortisol, it shifts us into left brain hemisphere dominance. And that's the hemisphere of doing what you've always done. There's no creativity there. You know, as I say to my students, it's a bad idea to throw in a cartwheel when you're running from a lion. <laughs> so the brain's wired to go into program behaviors as soon as it's under threat. So you see people that come to healthcare professionals with pain often have a very hard time learning because they have so much pain in the system that the body doesn't think it's a wise investment to try something that is perceived by the individual as a risk, which is another reason why I built my system, as I'll show you in a second, on very simple foundation principles that are the very basis of health itself, but are commonly overlooked and not used by medical professionals because they're considered too simple to be saleable, right? Which is yeah. dumb, of course. right? So, um, so to pick up the, the thread there, so the step two in my system is where are you out of balance with regard to the two forces that create life, which is yin and yang, the feminine, receptive, nurture, cooling, anabolic, parasympathetic, and the yang, See, yin multiplies power. When you go to sleep at night, you multiply power, just like when you plug your phone in on a charger. So if a person's low on sleep, they cannot repair their body effectively and don't have enough energy. This is why you see so much sugar, coffee, and stimulant use because people are actually medicating themselves from doing jobs that they don't like and being in relationships they don't want to be in, but they think God will burn them in hell until death do you part because that's what their marriage contract says. So they live these kind of, unhappy relationships with spouses and they live in jobs to make money, but they hate what they're doing. So they come home at night and they don't start living till they get home at night. So they stay up late at night watching TV and eating uh, foods that medicate their psychological pain. And so yin by definition means anything that multiplies power. Yang means anything that divides power, which is linked to your sympathetic uh, nervous system which increases readiness for exercise or fighting or flighting or working out or phys anything that elevates your respiratory heart rate and heart rate brings you into a sympathetic state. So if the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems get out of balance then you see all sorts of shit going down, right? The most common problem being sympathetic overload, which to the degree you're sympathetically dominant, that's fire, that's the element of fire and alchemy the water system in your body gets dried out and depleted and you end up with all sorts of, you know, a long, long list of health problems just from those imbalances right there. So my practitioners are taught to analyze all their data and determine in each key system of the body, what one's too yang or too yin. So someone who's a couch potato is too yin. They're waterlogged, they're bogged down. So those people, we got to warm up. We got to fire them up. We got to stimulate them to get moving. But you get someone that's over-exercising, they're excessively yang, they're dried out and depleted. And they're kind of compensate with all sorts of protein powders and 
Red Bull and Monster and Five Hour and steroids and every other trick in the fucking book that ultimately ruins their athletic career and their health. So once we analyze the data and we say, okay, where are they out of balance? Then we realize there's choices that have to be made. So your third step in my system is there's only three, three choices you can make in relationship to any person, place, or thing. The optimal choice, which is the one that's best for you because the choices are dream, goal, or objective, affirmative. If I go to bed on time, I will play better golf. If I eat the right food, I, will, uh, I won't need Viagra to keep my dick up, et cetera. So the optimal choice is the one that's dream affirmative. The suboptimal choice is usually the one that gives instant gratification, but almost always causes problem on your dream team. And that's who is supporting you to achieve your dream goal or objectives. And if you don't consider the needs of those people in your relationship and you act totally self-centered, you create so much dissonance on your dream team that you usually end up with all sorts of problems at work, problems in the home, and you're just fighting and, and coping. And then you get drugs involved in that coping process and, you know, Christian counselors that you know get, get you in more trouble. And then, um, and then so you have the optimal, the suboptimal, the third choice is do nothing. And it's got positive and negative applications. The positive application is whenever you've got to make a decision, but you don't have enough information to make an intelligent decision, doing nothing means calling a timeout and doing some research to get all the cards on the table to make an intelligent decision. Do nothing also means calling a timeout whenever you're getting into a heated argument in a relationship and it gets to the point where you can't stay connected at the heart anymore and it's starting to damage the relationship. So I teach people call a timeout and say, I'll come back when I can stay connected to you at the heart and we can contribute to this conversation meaningfully because if I go any further, I might act in ways or you might act in ways that are damaging to the relationship. The, dam the dangerous application of do nothing is apathy, to not care. Apathy is actually the opposite of love. People think that hate is, but research shows that children raised by apathetic parents have a higher rate of death, disease, and criminality than parents that beat their children. Because they can try to curb it to show, hey, at least they cared enough, just didn't know how to raise me right or do it right. Well, exactly. And, and as I say, look, if your parents are beating on you, at least they love you enough to invest their time into connecting to you. It's not optimal by any means. But parents that don't give a shit, now, now you're, you know, children raised in that environment, they, they, they die. I mean, they just have no sense of nourishment and connection and love, and there's tons of research showing that's a death sentence right off the beginning, and kids often won't even last two or three years in that environment before they die. So once you know what the dream is, and once you know where they're out of balance, you know choices need to be made, and then you look at number four, the four doctors. Dr. Happy relates to the mind and the air element and alchemy, because the air element's connected to thinking, and it's also connected to prana or life force from breathing. The air element's connected to breathing, which is our chief survival function you 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 breathing is the chief oxygen's the chief nutrient for survival you can't go with oxygen for more than about five minutes and your brain starts to die you can get by without food and water a lot longer than that so anytime a person has a breathing pattern disorder it's a major threat to the system and one of the problems in our culture is people don't realize this but sugar is a very powerful acid processed sugar and it immediately begins to acidify the blood so anytime someone's got a breathing pattern disorder and they're eating more sugar than their body can effectively metabolize, if it elevates insulin, it's going to elevate your breathing rate and trigger a sympathetic response. So you can't actually, I see all these people studying Wim Hof and going to all these breathing workshops and I look at their diet and I go, you're just pissing in the fucking wind because your body has to upregulate your ventilation rate to a very high level to because oxygen actually turns out to be an alkalinizer of the blood. So if people keep eating a diet in, with too much simple sugars in it, the chief regulatory mechanism of the whole musculoskeletal system is thrown out of balance. And whenever you start breathing fast like that, it triggers a sympathetic fight or flight reaction. And now your autonomic nervous system's out of balance. So we look at Dr. Happy, which really says, what are my values about what's happy making for me? And what am I willing to do to create happiness for myself every day instead of waiting for God to make my life perfect or heaven to land in my lap? 
and your values then have to be oriented toward doctor diet. What is the, my values around food quality and individualizing my diet for my specific needs based on what my body's feedback system is telling me, which is anything that's decreasing your performance or your health. What are my values around rest? And what are my values around movement? So if we look at the alchemy of that, doctor movement is the fire element, which is chiefly the sympathetic system or how we divide our energy. Dr. Diet is the earth element, which is the marriage of all four elements that create life. And Dr. Quiet is the water element. And they also correlate to the season. So Dr. Happiness is spring. Dr. Movement is summer. Dr. Diet is fall where we harvest, bring the fruits and vegetables in. And Dr. Quiet is winter where we go into a rest cycle. So my evaluations then my students are taught to take their evaluation and then identify what are the key things that need to be balanced for each of those four doctors i say you can take up to 16 findings and from that you look for the common denominators and you do not give a client more than four objectives or they won't do any of them it'll overwhelm them and what you'll find is that when you have a skilled assessment, for example, sleep can be involved in every one of their problems. When you understand the science and physiology of sleep, you look at most cases and you're like, fuck, this person is never gonna heal if they don't get to bed. And if they don't change their diet, they're never gonna sleep because they're stimulating themselves so heavily with stimulants that they cannot ever go into a deep restful sleep. So then we break that down. Then we have number five. So we write their program based on the analysis of all the data that's brought into four doctors. Then we say, now you have to make dream affirmative choices. And here's the ramifications of not doing that. Yesterday equals tomorrow. Then we go to five. There's five program design factors that I identified that if a person does, a therapist or a coach does not identify and succumb to these five factors, their program will be an expensive waste of money. Time, how much time does a person honestly have to do that program? And there I apply the two times, three times rule, which says it always takes twice as long as you think it will and costs three times as much as you assume it will. <laughs> so I say, if a person says they got an hour a day to exercise, they really have a half an hour. And if they say they have $2,000 to see you, it's probably going to cost them six by the time you get them all figured out. So we have time first, energy. How much energy do they have? Even if they have the time, if they're too depleted on energy and you design a program that takes more energy than they have, it'll never work. Factor three is willingness. How willing are they to do that program? How willing are they to heal? How willing are they to grow and, and embrace the change process? If people don't have a seven out of 10, when I ask them on a scale of one to 10, what's your willingness to do this program? If it's not at least a seven, it means that you're not effectively qualifying the dream. They're not inspired or motivated enough. Your program's not going to work. So you then have to go back and requalify the dream or you just have an expensive program, a bunch of therapy. And I tell my students that's very bad marketing because research shows Every satisfied customer on average will refer you about 15 customers in their lifetime. Every unsatisfied customer will be a negative force for the life of the customer. So I tell my students, if you don't kill your failures, you're doing a lot of bad work and it'll ruin your business. In fact, I built a policy many, many years ago of offering a money back guarantee because I applied this science and said to my clients, if you do exactly what we've agreed upon and shake my hand upon it and it doesn't work, at least to the point where you feel it's worth your investment, I'll give you your money back. And I've given money back three times in my entire career. Yeah, that's cute. Because I want to stay honest. So we have time, energy, willingness, finances, and then resource availability. For example, don't tell people to buy supplements that they can't afford. Don't write programs that require a gym if a person's got it. The nearest gym is 40 minutes away because if they only have an hour a day to do their exercise or whatever, and they have to drive 40 minutes in each way, it'll fuck their whole life up. So there you have the five key program design factors, time, energy, willingness, finances, and resource availability. If you don't consider those things, the paper you, the program you write isn't worth the paper it's written on. Six foundation principles, so number six, Nutrition, hydration, sleep, those are the feminine principles. Breathing, thinking, and movement, those are the masculine principles. 
So we always have to make sure that we're restoring breathing, working with their thinking model and how they process information in their world. And so we, uh, and then so nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, thinking, and movement. We have to teach them how to move effectively so they're not damaging their bodies with movement. Seven is the seven chakras. So we look at the psychophysical themes of the seven chakras largely to see what is the underlying mental emotional correlates to their pathology or their dysfunction eight is self-reflection so we teach them how to use a process of daily self-reflection to see where they can grow and do better the next day nine is practicing to the point that you have a new level of awareness so you're now at cognitive competency as long as you pay attention you do well 10 is a new level of development so now you've achieved uh, unconscious competency and I got to run and have a piss before I wet my pants. I'll be right back. Yeah, no worries. I can. Sorry about that. No, Everybody I... else probably needs a pee too. That's <laughs> all right. I can certainly hold it down. Um, hey, what I uh, would be replying here is I keep nodding my head yes, because what you see here is a fully on integrative approach. Uh, an approach here. You're seeing even a social implication, right? Your relationship implication, your choice implication, your thinking implication, nutrition, sleep, heck, the uh, paragraph uh, or the, I'm sorry, the chapter in my book about sleep kind of opens up with, hey, all else fails, uh, period, is not worth it if you don't get proper sleep, right? Is the end all be all really uh, to start. So what you're seeing, well, I love Paul's angles, uh, the way he tries to shape it to allow people to see, right? I mean, how else do you encompass, I don't know, a hundred different fields of, of health, wellness, training on different levels and try to bring that into just 10 simple steps for people to comprehend. A lot of what I hear is also logic, right? I mean, very simple. If you don't have the willingness to do it, if you're not willing to go all in. So the full on integrative approach here that, that Paul has taken is something uh, that's why you see me. I'm, I'm not saying much. I'm sitting back here nodding my head going, yeah, um, you don't see this focus on it's simply your behavior. It's simply your nutrition. It's simply your movement. It's just how you move. And if you move properly in some functional pattern, that will solve all of your problems, right? You're not hearing that. You're hearing a fully encompassed change of, of one's life that will evolve something. And uh, Paul, welcome back, brother. Yeah, sorry. I hate to inter interrupt the show, but my back teeth were starting to float and it wasn't tasting too good. Hey, no worries. I was actually, what I was uh, kind of informing people is um, kind of the entire integrative approach, right? Because I heard uh, an environmental approach. I heard a choices, inter, uh, interpersonal relationship approach, uh, a, a cognitive approach, what we believe, what we think, um, a routine approach, which is a behavioral approach, a movement, a hydration, a sleep, a nutrition, right? You're not narrowed to, like I was saying before, if you just adjust your movement and your posture, everything will be fine in your life. That it's this opening uh, of the entire thing. And for me, I can't help back and sit here and go, oh, logic. Oh, logic. This is what I hear is uh, obvious logic. Uh, common sense, really. Yeah, I hear logic, common sense of an incorporation of all that we know in so many different areas and not this hold fast ideal of it's uh, it's just what you think. It's just what you eat. It's just what you work out. You got to lift more weights. You got to have better posture. You got to release your myofascia. You got to do this and that. It's an, an open wide range of, of, well, most of the influences on the human development in life. Yes, you know, the alchemists had it right, as above, so below. Your thinking and your belief systems mirror themselves in your body. The psyche is a rainbow bridge between the mystery that some people call God or that quantum physicists call the zero point field or we could call pure potential if you want to get non-religious approaches. So the psyche is a rainbow bridge that connects the subtle energies of high vibration which would be you know, the field of mind or the non-local mind, which becomes local within us to matter, right down to your bones and your teeth and your, you know, your sex organs uh, and, and your feet touching the earth. So, and that's what the seven chakras are, is the rainbow bridge between the unknowable, what happens after death. We have lots of theories. I have my own theories because I've done enough shamanic journeys to die and be excited to make it home. So I've had a little tour on the other side of the curtain a few times. Yeah, I've been there a few times, uh, sometimes not by choice either, just uh, just no. place there. Yeah, I've been there not by choice too, with you know motorcycle racing accidents and all sorts of 
crazy shit. You know, I've, I've uh, had plenty of broken bones and trips to the hospital and meetings with God on the other side. And for some reason I was supposed to make it to this interview, but, uh, <laughs> well, I'll take it. I'm glad you did. Uh, I had a, a question is, uh, I had a, another gentleman on the show a couple of times. Um, uh, Dr. Jack Cruz, who is a uh, neurosurgeon. I don't know if you know of him or not. Oh yes, I do. He's got a, he's, is he the guy that's into the ice baths and all that stuff? Yeah, he does ice baths, uh, circadian light therapy, basically outside grounding, re renewing electrons. And he's heavy therapy. into like a, a keto diet. Um, I, yeah, I want to lean that way. Uh, I haven't, uh, jumped up with, it's been a couple months. He, he does a lot of additions. I saw an interview with him on Gaia TV. Yeah. Uh, interesting. But I certainly would be somebody he would have an interesting time in a debate with. Yeah, I, I some of the circadian stuff is, is rather interesting to me. Uh, and I don't know how much of it is the belief principle, right? If you believe something, therefore, it has an effect on what you're doing. Um, you know, and some of the light stuff I have found when I was kind of in a, a, an interesting place in my life seemed, seemed to have worked. But again, I, the placebo effect is strong in anything we believe. But um, you know, the avoidance of the blue screens, the toxicity of 5G, these kind of things that have those are real. Yeah, he's he's kind of walked down that road in uh the idea of trying to uh renew your electrons through grounding, uh, but also it has to come through diet. He just, he's like, you can go live at the equator and it won't matter in, unless the body's ready to recharge for it. In certain ways of uh sunlight direction, when to avoid sun, it's some interesting stuff. So I, I just kind of wondered your take on some of that. A lot of his stuff is really good, and and all the circadian issues are very real. I've studied it very extensively. I teach on that. In fact, I show maps in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. Almost everything we're talking about is presented for laymen in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy. And um I, th I think he's very sharp. He's on to a lot of things. Some of the things he said I would challenge him on, but as as academically trained people go he's definitely high high caliber yeah for sure and here's an open-ended question all right i'm ready for this yeah. cognitive rampage uh, what is wrong with the fitness world today well first of all you need as much knowledge to be effective as a fitness specialist as you do to be a chiropractor or a physical therapist hands down remember those people go to school for four years to get a degree and the heaviest thing they use is a stretch band and a pink dumbbell. Yet we have people going into the gym that have failed in the medical system. And when you look at research, for example, research shows that when they take large MRI samples of people that have never had one history of an incidence of back pain, they find 72% of them have a disc bulge of significance. And when their MRIs are shown to a panel of surgeons blind, they deem 50% of them need to be on the operating table right now. So as a guy who's very studied in orthopedic rehabilitation, I can tell you people walking into the gym are just booby traps waiting to go off. And the gym has been a very big source of income for me for many, many years. So we don't have a, a, a system of qualification or education anywhere in the world for exercise professionals. They don't know how to do skilled orthopedic assessments. They don't know how to recognize red flags such as neurological disorders. They don't know how to do sensory evaluations, motor evaluations. They don't know how to test the autonomic nervous system. They don't, they don't know much at all about diet. They get into all their fads. So if they're in a keto fad, everybody and their dogs on a keto diet. If they're a triathlete, then they're eating like triathletes. If they're bodybuilders, everybody's on a bodybuilders program. Um, they don't understand exercise uh, science. They don't understand kinesiology well. Um, they don't understand psychology very well. Nobody leaves their, their home life and their stress and their relationships at the front door of a gym. Um, I've been a consultant to the best athletes in the world, movie stars and the movers and shakers of the world. And I can tell you, I have to apply every bit of my skill holistically to help these people. And oftentimes, uh, you know, one of the most common reasons for perform performance plateaus in professional athletes that I've run into is that they're raised in a Christian family, they're married, they're telling their wife a lie that they're in a monogamous relationship, which she thinks they are. But I've seen guys with as many as four different phones for the different women they're having sex with and relationships with in multiple cities while trying to keep each of them compartmentalized and the stress of living that lie and having that many multiple personalities to deal with literally burns them out to the point that they start having back injuries and all sorts of structural problems and performance problems. And the doctors keep trying to fix it with surgery and physical therapy and drugs. But at the end of the day, it's all mental, emotional stuff that's never been addressed. And I've had 
many of these athletes crying their eyes out because they thought because they they heard through the grapevine whether i got two wives or i have an open relationship type stuff they come and think i'm going to te teach them how to cheat better and i i just say that's you know that's fucking childish and you're not here to learn that from me i don't support that and your body obviously won't support it either and i'm not going to you know so i say if you want to have sex with lots of women good just be honest with them what's good for the goose is good for the gander and if you want to have sex with lots of women then you got to offer each of them the same thing and one of the problems with male uh, males in general is they they want to uh, have what they want, but they don't want to share it with their partner. So they want to screw everybody they want to, but they want their wife to be completely committed. And that's to me, that's just um, it's childish, it's selfish, it's immature, and it's uh, a very uh, psychologically undeveloped male. So I'm only sharing that as an example of how many of these athletes are right at the end of their career getting traded they can't figure out why they can't perform their adrenals are burnt out their body hurts but rarely is it actually a physical problem it's a psychological problem and it has to do with being raised in a religion that confines our natural instincts for sex and for pleasure and men are you know designed by nature to spread their seeds so when you start getting put into religious systems that pit you directly against your instincts you're setting somebody up for a lifetime of physical, mental, and emotional trauma. Yeah, yeah. You constantly have. I've referred to it sometime as the guilt guillotine that that sits above you and and everything that you're doing or feel like you're naturally pulled to do. Uh, I mean, in, in that answer, I mean, what what we're hearing is too many people can easily call themselves a fitness or health and wellness instructor and maybe don't take on the seriousness to which that really is and educating yourself from a holistic standpoint from a an integrative standpoint really so you get this uh i don't know like like you said a renter friend or someone that counts to 10 and and not i guess maybe i don't want to say not taking it seriously because perhaps they take it serious in their own field but um it, maybe it's a too easy of a field to call yourself maybe to be one and and Look, people learn a little bit you can get your personal trainer certification by taking a 75 question multiple choice test on the internet. So, and I don't want exercise professionals listening to me to think that I'm bashing them. I'm just stating the state of the industry. There are good ones out there and I've got over 10,000 people that have been trained by the Czech Institute that are highly skilled, but we don't, I tell them, don't call yourself a personal trainer because immediately you're going to be stereotyped. You're a holistic health practitioner. You're a holistic exercise specialist. You look at the body as an integrated system of system. The human body is a cybernetic system, which by definition is a system of systems. And if you only know about the musculoskeletal system, you don't realize that's very low on the totem pole of survival reflexes. Your organs are in charge of your musculoskeletal system. Your emotions are in charge of it. Your breathing's in charge of it. Your eyes are in charge of it. Your vestibular system's in charge of it. Your hearing's in charge of it. Your upper cervical spine's in charge of it. Your psyche's in charge of it. Uh, you know, your sacrum is higher on the order than the rest of the musculoskeletal system for reasons that I won't get into because it's too technical. But the point is most people that go get degrees in biomechanics and kinesiology are trained on models that see the body as a system of stick figures and they don't realize that the human musculoskeletal system is actually carrying out the biological and instinctual urges of the psyche and in the organs. I mean, this is what I tell people to make this point. If your colon's full, what does it tell your legs to do? Shut off. Not Find a toilet and a sit toilet on it. Run, yeah. Or in nature, squat. Well, I was going to say like shut off, like clinch. <laughs> well, yeah, that too. But... If your stomach's empty, what does it tell your body to do? If you were out in the wild, you'd have to go hunting. Right. So your stomach tells your body, you must go find something to eat. Mm. If your heart's empty, it says, go find someone to share love with. And so you find yourself looking all over for a mate, right? I could go through your glands and organs. Every single physical organ you have actually has a psychic function. That's a correlate. For example, when we have to make a tough decision about business or finances or relationship, isn't it true we often have to digest that before we can make a decision? Yeah, you have to walk through what it would be like, what what it where it's at, where yeah, I definitely. So, so metaphor, your whole digestive system in your physical body is also a psychological digestive system. Shit. But people keep this is why addictions are and obesity is, is such a thing that's so hard to get because people keep treating it, oh, you're fat because you just eat too much. 
But what people don't realize is the physical body feeds on food, the emotional body feeds on emotion, and the mental body feeds on thoughts. So if you're emotionally starved and you keep using food to try to heal that or nourish that, you'll make your body sick. And no matter how much you eat, you're still emotionally empty. Because you eat to get that. This tastes good. I like how that is. So you're getting these positive thoughts and reinforcement through something that you're thinking as you're eating that. Wow. I, yeah. Well, you're getting psychological associate, association is what it is. For example, most people associate sweet foods like cakes, donuts, and dessert foods with happy times in their life. So when their life is get challenging, if they don't know how to uh, work with an inner process, a mindfulness process, or they don't have systems for digesting their emotions, be it art therapy, journaling, reflective practices, then what they do is they don't realize they're using a symbolic representation of emotional freedom and they're putting it in their body, but now it overloads their digestive and physiological systems because that system's already overloaded. It's you're feeding the wrong body. If someone needs more mental stimulation and they don't realize that their job is boring or they're, they're, they're watching too much television instead of reading something that really nourishes them at the mental level, then they sit there and eat chips all for hours on end, watch TV, and they make themselves sick with processed garbage. So every part of our body actually has an emotional mental correlate function and spiritual practices are designed to develop the integrity and the integration of the subtle energy organs, which are in your etheric body, your astral body and your mental body. And those turn out to be the very organs that stay with us when we die. So we can remain conscious when we're, when we lose our body. So someone who does not develop a spiritual heart or does not develop the capacity to digest emotions and thoughts, when they die, they have no way to process the experience because they didn't develop past the physical level. And there's your rainbow bridge. And that's exactly what the chakra system says. That's what yoga is supposed to be about. Kundalini rising means your consciousness is rising up to higher vibrational levels. When, when Kundalini gets to your heart, it'll blow your heart wide the fuck open. And all the badasses that go through a kundalini experience, like in a shamanic ceremony, all of a sudden find themselves crying and being so emotionally moved watching movies. And they think something's wrong with them. I go, well, guess what? You're becoming a real man. I tell men, you're not a real man until you have equal access to your feminine capacity as you do your masculine. And a lot of guys in our culture say, that's pussy shit. Oh yeah, wait till you're going through a real relationship challenge with your wife and she says she's sick of you because you don't pay attention to her and you don't share anything and you're always aloof and all you want to do is watch fucking football all the time. Niagara Falls right after that, right? Yeah, you know, so, uh, you know, the thing too is, Adam, as you know as well as I do, we have a world full of great teachers, but they don't get any airtime. Why? Because the airtime is bought up by all these corporations selling us all this horse shit and all this modern new age spirituality. Oh, if you just take this workshop, you'll be healed. But it's the same with psychedelic drugs. You can do a thousand medicine journeys and the medicines will open up your unconscious and show you where you're not living and loving well, but that just opens a door. The so real work doesn't start till you get out of the journey and the medicine wears off and you say, okay, now that I've been given the gift of awareness, I have to be responsible enough to say I'm sorry to the people I've hurted and to change my behaviors and make that a spiritual practice. Otherwise, all you're doing is wasting plant medicines everywhere. Now that now you're just throwing good money after bad. And the next thing you know, you got a drug society that that's, well, just a bunch of stoned idiots, really. Yeah, chasing that experience again rather than maybe taking the message delivered from the experience and, and doing something with that, putting in the change, putting in those hours of the work. I mean, it's great to, to be unveiled. I, I, I've eaten six, seven grams at a time. I've been down those roads, uh, yeah. went and lived uh, with, with, uh, on a Native American reservation for some time. I mean, uh, I've walked those roads, but unless I came back and did something about that or changed it, I mean, it's almost a wasted vision. It, 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 well, yeah, it is. It, it's, it's, it goes from being something that has the power to turn you into a more enlightened human being. And, you know, 
to, to high, you know, people have a weird idea of enlightenment. They think someone that's enlightened has everything perfect. That's just horseshit. Enlightenment's an endless process. And as Ken Wilber shows, we grow in levels of consciousness and on lines of consciousness. So you can be an enlightened scientist, but not get along with your wife. Look at Steve Jobs. He was an enlightened, shall we say, product engineer or a great creator, but he couldn't get along with people. So he's very unenlightened in that level of his life. You can be an enlightened pilot, but not know shit about diet or exercise. So we grow through levels of consciousness, structure stages, which I won't go into because it'd be a long and complicated discussion for a quick discussion like this. But we basically go in a nutshell from self-centered, ethnocentric. So you see ethnocentric religious ideas. If you don't take Jesus as your savior, you're going to burn in hell and there's something wrong with you. Or if you don't, follow our way as an Islamic faith, you're an infidel. So those are all ethnocentric levels of consciousness, but they grow into postmodern, which means now that I know that I'm not happy going to church or to my Jewish temple every day, something's missing. What's in all the other religious faiths that might be more nourishing to me? Well, then you have to be adult enough to take the criticism of leaving the group, because now when you come off the hind tit and the social and the group mind, the herd mentality, those people will actually attack you. So if you're not ready to go and be an adult and stand on your own two feet, then you're gonna keep falling back into the group and then you will live, well then what'll happen is you'll come face to face with all the gods you're repressing and they'll show up as digestive troubles, as headaches, as breathing pattern disorders, as anxiety, as depression, as nightmares. But those are all the gods that we're repressing by not listening to spirit and not listening to our heart so once we grow to the point where we start investigating other philosophies to see what nourishes us, then we move out of an ethnocentric into a world-centric relationship. We go, ah, oh, the Chinese, these Taoists, they had their shit together. Oh, the Hindus, wow, they have 240,000 gods or something like that. They worship everything. Then you go to the Sufis and you look at the Sufi mystics. Well, the first principle of Sufism is there is no God but God. I worship everything and everyone. So paradoxically, within each of the world's major religions, you have the corporate branches that brainwash people. But within that group, there are mystics that become heretics. This is why Rumi said no one can get to God until they become a heretic. He made it very clear. Reading words on pages is not how you get to God. That's how you become programmed and you never see anything but the words on the page. People forget a symbol by definition is something that points beyond itself. But if you actually think you know what God is because you've read a book, you've turned the symbol into a sign. And that's why Nietzsche said a long time ago, God is dead. Mm. As soon as you think you know what, you, what God wants or what you're supposed to do to be a good person, you've just killed the flow of spirit and you've turned a symbol into a sign. And now your life just goes totally flat. And there's, not, there's nothing numinous anymore. There's no light in your life. There's nothing exciting. There's no mystery to grow to or to look for. So once you get to world centric or uh, modern, then you go to postmodern, which is where you learn to deal with paradoxes and everything about God is a paradox, right? It says right in the Bible, Isaiah 45, seven, I create the light and the dark. I create good and evil. I, the Lord do all these things, but the Christians fucking hate that passage so bad. They rewrote the damn thing about 25 years ago. So all the modern Bibles don't say that anymore. And then they'll tell you the Bible was, the inspired word of God and it's never been changed. And I'm like, you got to be fucking kidding me. Why don't you study the goddamn Bible and look at the history of the Bible? But what's my point? When you're at a low level of consciousness, you don't see the truth when it's right in front of you because you've been brainwashed to only see what you've been brainwashed to do, which is why the Christian preachers say, give me a child and I'll give you a preacher. I will brainwash that child for you. So then the postmodern stage takes you into a can take you into an existential uh, dichotomy because at that level people look at both sides of the fence and they realize everything cancels out so if a person doesn't realize that that's their invitation to developing their own relationship with god and their own relationship with the world or the universe and life then they get stuck because nothing makes sense anymore so each time you go up a structure stage it takes more intelligence and more presence and more openness to grow to the next level. So the highest stage we have today is the integral stage. And that's what Ken Wilber's teachings are really all about. Because at the integral level, you now have transcended and included. So at the very bottom, 
you have what's called magical consciousness. And that's thousands of years ago where we thought everything around us was magic, like lightning and how birth happened and all the things we didn't understand was magical. And our consciousness was very fused into nature. We were like a child. We didn't see ourselves as separate from nature in any way. And then you go to the mythical level, which is where all our tribal myths come from. Then you go to the traditional level, which is where fundamentalism is. Then you go to the postmodern level where you say, okay, all this Christian stuff's not making me happy or whole. And, he, and I'm going to burn in hell because I don't get along with my wife and can't live with her anymore. So if I get a divorce, I got to go to hell for it. So you realize that can't be very godly. There must be something richer. Then you go to the modern and you say, okay, let me try something like Baha'i, which is a mix of world faith. And you go, oh my God, I found the smorgasbord. But then you realize that that won't even do it because there's still conflicts you can't resolve. So now you go to the postmodern stage and you have to look at both sides of the fence. Then you get to the integral stage and you, by that time you realize you couldn't be here without the entire universe. You are made of earth, water, fire, air, and space. And the earth has been researched and found that all the elements in the earth came from the sun. And when they look in the sun, they find that all the elements in the sun came from every place in the universe because every star is actually the combination of all the other stars. And Itzhak Bentov showed this in his teachings a long time ago, if you read Stalking the Wild Pendulum, for example, and other teachings by Bentov, Bentov's the guy that invented the pacemaker. He was a highly evolved scientist. He was the first one to scientifically study meditation. And he shows you very clearly what we are takes the entire universe to create. We are a novel expression of the entire universe. So at the integral level, you bow down to the mystery and say, my God, it took the entire universe to produce this opportunity for me to look at the beauty and the grandeur of the mystery. And I need to dance and celebrate every day of my life because if I don't do that, I am not conscious of who and what I really am. And therefore, I am not worshiping life. And when you don't worship life, life will just tear you a brand new asshole. Brother, that by definition is what I call a cognitive rampage. It that is a definition. It's a heart rampage. Yeah. I have a heart on, man. <laughs> Brother, I could listen to you talk for hours, man. I, I mean, so much of this is, is looked over uh, in so many of our lives to some simplistic form. I mean, almost we are the light and the dark. Almost. I mean, that's kind of where we are. You, look, you can't yeah. have you cannot have mind without those two polarities. What would good be without evil? No, what it, would north be without south? What would inside be without outside? What would up be without down? What would day be without night? Your mind has to have those two polarities, or there cannot be movement. And consciousness needs three correlates, or you can't be conscious. And those three correlates are space, time, and movement. Well, space is relational at this level. But if you go to the quantum level, it's non-relational. And that's what this thing called God is, is that which is non-relational. And that's what we now know of as the non-local reality of mind. So time, time is the flow of events without which we could have no experience. And who are we? We're God experiencing itself. The reality of it is when we evolve, God evolves. That's, there's no other way about it. People don't, they, they like to argue about that because they think God is some completed deity, but it just doesn't pan out. If you do a lifetime of research and you do spiritual practices, you come to realize that God loves life because that's where God experiences what God is. And God cannot know God if God only goes for the good, because how, that, that means God has a bigger shadow than anybody. And that means we're all in trouble. As Carl Jung says, when the Christians created Jesus Christ, he cast a light so bright, they had to create Satan to counterbalance him. That's from a uh, man and his symbols, right? Uh, you know, I've studied so much of Jung. I've been studying his collective works for over 20 years, so um, I have a lot in there. But Jung also said no tree can grow to heaven unless its roots reach to hell. And, you know, when we're in hell, we can realize the pain teacher has come to tell us we're moving in the wrong direction. When your guts aren't working, it means you're doing something wrong. Your body's always trying to balance you to keep you alive. The autonomic nervous system is 100% devoted to your survivability. 
So when people show up with all sorts of autonomic dysregulation problems, it means they're actually killing themselves by not paying attention to what their choices are producing. Yes, I have, man, I have often spit out that thank God you have anxiety and depression because that's your body and brain screaming at you. Get us the fuck out of here. Yes. Do something, do something, listen to that rather than numb that, rather than take the pill to overcome that. I mean, we, we are programmed to find, like you said earlier in the show, that this quick fix, I've paid you a hundred bucks, give me the pill so I leave without my problems. When those problems, those feelings that you're experiencing, that's telling you fucking change, do something different, get us out of here. That's the feedback system. Look, taking drugs without an honest effort to first do no harm and change your diet, your lifestyle, your four doctors, your six foundation principles would be no different than covering the oil light on your car with a piece of tape so you don't have to look at the fact that it's turned red and then bitching when you're stuck in the middle of the freeway with a seized up engine, <laughs> right? That, that, that It's called the idiot light because people don't do anything when they see the light go on. They just think, oh, I don't have time to stop and get oil or you know, like one of the things that drives me absolutely bad is when I'm with people and they run out of gas. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> You've been watching the needle go down. I mean, like you have someone pick you up from an airport and you're in a hurry to get to an appointment and they got no gas in their car and they don't stop. And I'm sitting in the back seat. I've been I've been with taxi drivers doing shit like this. I'm like, what the fuck? You drive for a living. You're not even watching your gas gauge. Well, what? How do you consider yourself to be a professional driver? You're charging me to sit on the side of the fucking road, wait for a gas can to come. The point is, is that because this is so profitable, there's a handful of corporations making trillions, not billions, trillions of dollars by programming people to actually think that their body is a machine. People think food is like gasoline. You can shop for the cheapest prices but they don't realize food is energy and information. It's not just energy. If you eat food with pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides, you are eating food that has information attached to it that is completely disruptive to your biological systems and it will confuse the shit out of it and leave you with diseases and disorders that you will then get cut out while you keep eating the same goddamn food. You know, the, 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 but this is actually part of the plan. You see, Jung said all religious systems are designed to protect you from the direct experience of God. And, and when you, most people don't get that. But before I really point that out, what I want to see is this. Life is a spiritual gymnasium where we come to learn how to use the creative powers invested in us by the universe. But we come to planet Earth because everything's trapped in matter. So to make large changes that threaten the lives of other people is hard to do. When Hitler tried to take over the world, he needed a million people, a lot of money, and it was almost impossible for him to do without the whole world figuring it out and deciding to get involved. When you leave this dimension of reality to the afterlife, change happens at the speed of thought. Steiner says the first thing that happens when you die is you find yourself flying around the universe at the speed of thought until you realize it's you doing the thinking. So if we, when we're here on planet earth, we're in kindergarten for souls that are on their way to becoming citizens of the universe and matter slows everything down. And so we have this field of tensions, a dialectic within which mind actually functions. If you don't have a field of tension, if you have an electric motor with no north and south pole, it won't rotate, right? You don't, you have to have a field of tension to make a motor work. So when we're here on earth, if you, if anyone pays attention, they'll see every day there's something challenging, but there's something beautiful. If you look for it, if you look at the news, you'll see a lot of bad news. But if you actually gave equal amount of time and commitment to showing what was going beautifully in people's lives, you'd see that babies are being born, celebrations are happening, graduations are happening, accomplishments are being made, records are being set, uh, goals are being met, milestones are being met. But we've got this addiction to bad news because of the negative bias in our nervous system from living in nature for so long where we have to pay attention to what can kill us, but we don't realize that if we don't learn to consciously ask ourselves, is it really true? Am I really under threat? I tell people that I coach, 
when you feel stressed out and you got a challenge in front of you, before you start acting irrationally, ask yourself these questions. Can I breathe? Yes, that's covered. Do I have access to food and water? Yes, that's covered. Do I have access to shelter? Yes. Do I have access to warmth? And is my metabolism functioning? That's covered. Are there people in my life that love me? And if the answer is no, then the question is, do you love yourself? So if you have food, water, shelter, warmth, safety, and people in your life that love you, you have no reason to freak out. Now it's time to get still. And that's when you meditate. That's when you use your challenges to grow you beyond your own perceived limitations. And that's how you knock down impossibility walls, things that you think you can't handle. But most people are so hypochondriac that the first little bump on their toe or the first time somebody looks at them wrong or the perfectionists who think their boobs are perfect and their face is perfect and their muscles are perfect and someone doesn't like it, they go into a meltdown. That's just all kind of childish stuff. But when we really take the time to say, you know, every challenge is seated with an opportunity and it's up to us to either work on it or reach out to people that have already made a journey down that road. You know, I've gone bankrupt. I know that process. I've been through a divorce. I know the process. I know what happens. So people that have lived and really honestly engaged themselves become the angels that can guide the rest of them. But if we keep running to the drugstore and to doctors that make tr truckloads of money just cutting shit out and lying to you, not that they all do, but a lot of them are just so deceived themselves, they might as well be. Or you run to the church and you get told a bunch of stories that just lock you deeper into your, uh, and pit you against your own instincts and your own creativity. And you're now you know, needing a daddy in the sky. That's why Osho said Western religions are religions for children. They need a daddy in the sky to tell them what they do, need to, what to do. Eastern religions are religions for adults because there is no daddy in the sky. There is no God in Buddhism. They don't even believe in a soul, a lot of those people. You know, so if you look at Taoism, uh, Buddhism, religions, nature, nature, na nature religions like Shinto, you don't have all this, um, I got to take orders from this invisible man that only speaks to me from this ancient book that's <laughs> seriously outdated in many ways. So we really... We really are in a, in a special place because this is where we come to learn to use our creative powers. And because of the density of matter, things don't happen too fast. And it gives us a chance to work through things. And as we mature and our consciousness rises, we start to realize that there's a lot of magic going on, right? Uh, Sri Aurobindo did research to find out what were the qualities that legitimate spiritual masters had in common. People that could do miraculous healings and do things like Sai Baba, manifesting things out of thin air. Because he thought, and he was right, some of them are charlatans, but he knew some of them were for real. And there are, they're, you know, it's well documented. There's breathitarians that don't need to eat. And, and can live off the air alone. And I've seen, uh, recently saw a documentary of a scientific investigation into one. He, he demonstrated to them scientifically beyond a shadow of a doubt he could do this. Uh, if you study Joseph Rael, a, a, a Pueblo medicine uh, Indian man uh, who done the, he's done the sun dance, I think 16 times, which is four days dancing nonstop, 24 hours a day with no food and water. He tells you in their training, they all get to the point where they don't need to eat anymore. They can live off the power of spirit and breath alone. He chose to eat because he likes the social engagement of it. But there, there, my point is there are very, very evolved people around that show us what's possible. And what Aurobindo showed is that these spiritual masters had four things in common. One, they could all turn a negative into a positive. They could take any problematic situation and find the positive possibility or potential within it. Two, they create beyond the laws of physics. And here we have a, a whole world culture conditioned to believe in Newtonian physics, yet there's masses, massive amounts of science from quantum physics to astrophysics to sacred geometry to sonic geometry, you name it, showing that those are very limited viewpoints. And even Einstein's constant like the speed of light is not true. There's tons of scientists that have shown no light is not limited 
286,000 miles per second. And without going into all the research on that, but if you want to look at that, look at the book Science and Human Transformation. One of the world's top scientists shows you that the chakra system multiplies speeds of light. And what we call mind has vast speeds that move much faster than light. So they, they can turn a negative to a positive. They can create beyond the laws of physics. And we all create beyond the laws of physics. What do you think a dream is? What do you think having an idea is? You're sitting there thinking, I would like to start a new business. Well, you've just done the creative work and then you move into the laws of physics to dress that idea up. So you take something that's invisible, intangible and non-local and you materialize it. So the masters are just showing you if you really learn to use your mind, you can create beyond the laws of physics consciously. Next, they create equanimity and harmony wherever they go. No matter how much chaos is, their presence has a stabilizing effect. Finally, they never do the healing work themselves. They all stated they draw their power from unconditional love. Hmm. And if God is unconditional love, then people need to realize the answer to all your conscious or unconscious prayers and requests is yes. That's why I say, be careful what you pray for, because if you're not conscious, you won't like what you get. God says yes to everything because God can't know God until God experiences all the potentials that God is, which is infinite. And therefore, we now get to the reality that science is showing that we don't have one universe. We could potentially have an infinite number of them because God is that powerful and that willing to try everything now. Because at that level, there's nothing but now. Time is actually an illusion that allows us to have experience so that God can cultivate wisdom because you can't have knowledge without making mistakes and you can't have wisdom without time experience and mistakes. And so God can't really, God may be all knowing, but knowing is not experiencing until you do it. You can study to be a cardiac surgeon for four years. And if the first person I roll in on to, for you to operate on is your mother, you will be shit shocked because you have no experience. You just have a head full of knowledge. So the beautiful thing is, here is God everywhere experiencing itself. And that's why we all know inherently that our life goes best when we stay in a state of loving ourselves, loving life, and even being brave enough to love our challenges. That's why Jesus said, love thy enemy as thyself. You know, if you look at the teachings of Jesus, compared to what Christians actually say and do, it's so radically off. Jesus was one of the most radical spiritual teachers that ever lived. And Christians don't even come close in general to practicing what he teach. And that's all you got to do is look at all the wars started over religious idealism and how the political system and the military industrial complex just hijacks religion and they fall for it hook, line and sinker. Uh, when I was a kid in the Christian church, one minute we're singing onward Christian soldiers marching off to war. And the next minute they're telling you God is love and Jesus loves you. And I'm like, how in the hell do you think Jesus would be marching off to war to slaughter people? Study the Crusades. It'll blow your mind. And I'm like, I'm eight and I've already got this one figured out. And you guys drive the bus that I go to school in? I'm nervous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Jesus saw in the metaphor, right? Never preached within a church. Um, he was in the trenches. He was with the, the of the people. You didn't see him sitting on high or living in mansions or having all the biggest churches. That's not where he was. I mean, that's an exact opposite of what you see, right? Joel yeah. Osteen's of the world and they're in their arena preaching or their arena churches and massive. Uh, yeah. the, you didn't see that. But the whole corporate concept of religion is you can't get to God unless you go through the church or through the priest. But Jesus said, lift a stone and I will be there. Split the wood and I will be there. What was he saying? God is everywhere and in everything. This we get back right to the first principle of Sufism. There is no God but God. I worship everything and everyone. And believe me, but I know I'm fiery. That way. I don't have anything against the religions because what they are is fields of resistance to put us in exactly the situation to make us uncomfortable when we're not using our creative potential. And that's what makes us grow. But the thing is, as we've been discussing, if you keep drugging it and cutting it out and not listening to your body, you don't grow. 
you're medicating the message from your soul that says, guess what? It's time to graduate and go off and create something that creates more love in you instead of sitting there reading a book, wondering why God is such an asshole. <laughs> the, the duality necessary of the creation, the pushback or the resistance yeah. from where we are to blossom us or blossom anything or any group into something different, more beautiful through that resistance of it, man. Yes. And, and I don't want people to misunderstand me. I'm not anti-Christian. I'm not anti-religion. I just feel sad. And I also am very, very, a lot of the people behind these organizations know exactly what they're doing. And that to me, people that don't know better are like children. And I don't like seeing children abused, even if they're in adult bodies. We've lost our tribal environment. We've lost our elders. We don't have a system for initiation into adulthood. So we have a, an entire almost world culture now of children in adult bodies that still don't know how to think for themselves, that still haven't entered into the archetype of the warrior where you stand up for what's true for you and you say, what are my values and what is it that I need to live and love more fully? And if you don't get to the point where you can be a warrior and tell your parents, no, I'm not going to go to that church or no, I'm not going to go to school to be a doctor. I'm an artist or I'm a musician. Then you end up living a life of health challenges and mental challenges and emotion. And look, here we are today. We got more doctors, more physical therapists, chiropractors, osteopaths, nutritionists, dietitians, personal trainers, yoga teachers. We got more exercise and healthcare professionals. We've got more associates of arts degrees, bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, PhDs, MDs, doctorates of science per capita than ever in the history of man. And we are the sickest most suicidal, most lost people we've ever been. Why? Because people keep paying attention to what everybody else is telling them and think that just because someone's got a degree that they're a priest or a god, but not realizing that it doesn't matter what that person says. As I say, if a person can't teach health and exercise and nutrition naked, they don't belong teaching that because they obviously don't have it figured out themselves. So the point I'm making is don't ask someone to help you solve a problem that hasn't figured their own out in that regard. Don't ask someone that's not a mechanic to help you fix your car. Don't ask someone that's not a pilot to fly an airplane when you're in it. <laughs> but the reality of it is if we really look, we can find people anywhere that have the wisdom to support us, but you have to be brave enough to deal with change because chaos always precedes change. You gotta be brave enough to put down your cigarettes or put down your beer or put down your potato chips or put down your, your Oreo cookies or put down your addiction to violent video games or uh, watching the Super Bowl instead of doing something useful for yourself. You know, not that any of those things are bad, it's just that if your life is consumed by that, then you're actually not living. And you're not growing. These you're just, are the distractions, the comfort places we like to find ourselves in. Yeah, that's why these things are called weapons of mass distraction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they don't realize these are tools that are used to brainwash people. I, I tell pe my students all the time, pay close attention to how many screens people are look at. And then listen very carefully when I say this word, tell a vision television is used to tell you the vision they want you to act out and they want you to live and what they want you to buy and that they want you to think you're nobody if you don't have this car or that your tits don't look a certain way and your skin doesn't look a certain way or you don't look like a fashion model. I mean, is brainwashing full on and people are glued to it and they don't realize you go into a hypnagogic state and your metabolic rate drops down anytime you're looking at a screen, which makes you highly programmable because you're in a trance state. Yeah, you're so, always in this meditation state. That's uh, actually one of the books I'm reading now, You Can't Buy Me Love, um, about the whole marketing approach, how it changes how you feel, what you think you should be, and you, the yeah. psyche of the individual. So, so, but you see, to loop back, do you see all of this produces 
the physical, emotional, and mental resistance. If you want to get stronger in a gym, you got to go meet resistance. You can't get stronger emotionally till you actually meet your challenges honestly and openly with the intention to do what's best for everybody involved. You can't grow mentally until you actually put the time and energy in to using your mind to solve challenges or find teachers and mentors that can guide you and teach you how to think. So we are in an elementary school for souls. And if we don't participate in class, then we just keep reincarnating over and over and over again. And there's Buddha's wheel of samsara right there. And there's nothing wrong with that. God loves this shit, right? What do you do when you're in, if you become fully enlightened, what's next? As Joseph Campbell says, if you reach nirvana, you, well, you might pop out as an ant or a cockroach next. So you have to start all over. <laughs> God's got all the time in the world. So in other words, what I'm saying is from a spiritual perspective, God says, yes, take all the fucking time you want because I've got nothing but time. It's up to us to decide when we're ready to get out of first grade and go to second grade and get out of second grade and go to third grade. And there's your structure stages of consciousness. And, you know, so on the bottom end, we've got the lost children wearing suits. And at the top end, we've got the Dalai Lama, Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, you know, the saints and the sages and the gurus, right? Look at people like Gandhi and, you know, Martin Luther King. And like, we've got all the great examples all around us. And you can tell who the good ones are because they get shot. <laughs> yeah, that's that's funny, man. I uh, I, I do a little stand-up comedy. One of the, uh, I'll just ruin the joke out there now. Uh, one of the jokes I say, I ask the crowd if they've heard uh, the saying, the good die young. Of course, they've heard this saying, and I said, that's why I wake up every morning. I'm like, fuck, I'm still a piece of shit. I keep waking up every morning. Nobody got me. I'm alive. Find some old guy in the audience, and I'm like, oh, you're a real piece of shit, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I know. <laughs> I'm still fucking here, man. Well, you know, the good thing is, is that flowers grow well in shit, and, and that's what I tell people. The shit of your life is the fertilizer for higher consciousness. Just be a better gardener. I tell my students all the time. Think of your body as a garden. You have to pay attention to what you do in a garden. If you don't balance the soils, you get lots of weeds and parasites. If you don't pay attention, the rabbits will come eat all your vegetables before you do. So the, the thing is, is that we are very porous, right? 60% of what's on your skin enters your body. You sit in a bathtub full of chlorine, 60% of the chlorine in that bath water will walk right through your skin. People think they're somehow closed off from the environment. We're breathing in 25,900 breaths, breaths a day on average, which interestingly is exactly how many years it takes our sun to go one lap around the Milky Way galaxy. Holy shit. Steiner and, and Joseph Campbell both. Steiner shows you how the entire human physiology is linked into the entire cosmic system of cycles. The yogis figured this out thousands of years ago, meditating in caves. But the point that I'm making is, we literally are the universe and we literally are like a moving fountain. We're turning over 2 million blood cells a second. You're turning over your skin cells every three to four days. You're turning over the lining of your entire digestive tract every four days. Your bones turn over every three to four weeks. Every cell in your body turns over. So what I'm saying is that we're like a, a living fountain. You know, you go to a park with a big fountain. And from 300 meters away, it looks like a tree made of ice. But as you get closer, you go, oh, that thing's moving. Well, we're, we're so used to not realizing that we're constantly changing what's flowing through us. And it's what you put into that thing is food, hydration, emotions, and thoughts that ultimately determines how beautiful that is. And the first person that needs to be beautiful for is yourself, or it doesn't matter how good you look to other people. Yeah, so much. I th I think people. Well, we try to make our life. Still, we try to take that fountain and shape a routine that we feel this comfort zone in, this safety in, and say, if we stay here, then you know, I don't have to keep moving. I I'm used to what's happening. This is the normal, uh, and I can kind of. I don't know. We get complacent, right? You find that apathetic positioning of our lives where we then wake up one day and this quote midlife crisis happens, right? We haven't yeah. experienced things. We're wondering where, where it's all gone. Um, and, and, and rather than challenge, challenging ourselves, your own thoughts, your own wants, desires, your own needs, you know, all of those things in some 
resistance to almost to create the duality to, to shape our own lives to something new that we are that fountain constantly for some people to think that they knew that they were regenerative every seven days completely all on inside and out they'd freak them the fuck out <laughs> they wouldn't even well you know the thing is is that i think you know that um one like that fountain we are a constant process of change but the thing that creates the illusion that we're not changing is making the same decisions over and over again, even when they aren't working. Even Einstein said you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. Yeah. But look, that's that. Who was it, man? That you'll probably know. They they mentioned that the I ah ah oh, it's elude me where um oh I got to remember anyway. The the idea is that oh yeah it was uh, the gentleman that came on my podcast Tony uh Tony Wright where he talked about uh, what's scary to him, he may have pulled it somewhere else, is that all we have to study the brain is the brain itself. So how or why would the brain tell on itself in any way? Well, here's the, the, the to extend that further, people that aren't paying attention say that consciousness is not involved, that it's a byproduct of the brain. But as, as um, Nassim Harriman says, don't they realize that it's consciousness that's studying consciousness? Yeah, right. It's, that's the truth. You have to be conscious to write the mathematical equations. You have to be conscious to look into the telescopes and the microscopes and design. The, so the paradox of it is all the while they're trying to justify this scientific materialistic view. They're just, re, just refuting their own philosophy by not paying attention to the fact that if they weren't conscious, they couldn't even look into the brain. And so, you know, People don't realize that what they're looking for as consciousness is actually a misnomer because what we're conscious of is what we're conscious of. You're conscious of my voice, but consciousness is the zero point field. It's the reference point from which all movement emerges. We can only be conscious of something that's moving, right? If someone's not thinking, there's no electroencephalogram activity. Ken Wilber showed he could stop his brain completely. Great meditators can do that too. You can just shut the brain completely off, but then there's nothing there. You're in a state of progeny or pure awareness. So what God is, is like the dance floor. The dance floor never moves, but it enjoys every dance in town and it gets to do everything without doing anything. <laughs> and so consciousness is the backdrop of awareness that allows us the very basis to be conscious of. So if you look at mathematically, it's zero. It's everywhere and nowhere simultaneously. And look at all the great research now showing that mind is really a non-local field that everyone's intimately connected in. And there's mountains of research showing that. The one, a great book is One Mind by Larry Dossie or Real Magic by Dean Radin or Entangled Minds by Reed, Dean Radin. I mean, I got, a, I got 100 books on this topic. But you see, the point I'm making is we keep looking for consciousness. Well, you can't find consciousness in the brain because it's a non-local reality. And you only see brain activity when somebody's thinking about something. Simulates their consciousness. Some kind of it. Yeah, it's, it's actually, in other words, they're looking at the dance and trying to figure out where the dance comes from. But they forget all dances require a dance floor. But you can't weigh and measure the dance floor because it is the zero point. It is the flat line when someone dies and they flat line they're now back to the dance floor mm. they're one with the dance floor and there's nothing to measure there because it is the no thing that gives birth to something <laughs> hence the you can't, you hence can't the measure no thing with an instrument looking for something <laughs> <laughs> that's looking for itself in the awareness of its own stimulation oh man yeah, that's a fucking mind trip right there, man. I've often, uh, I, I've read a lot. I like I like Freud for a few reasons, right? Mm -hmm. um, one, I think he's gangster as shit because yeah. he's one of the first guys that came out is like, no, it's not demons because you want to fuck your mom. You know what I mean? You, you got to have some mm, to say something like that back then. Yeah. And, and so the when he starts to talk of the notion of the subconscious and how, you know, there's almost no sci scientific evidence to point to a subconscious unless we look at behavioralism and shit like this. But the idea is like, well, how how can we understand or know the subconscious? Because once we are aware or conscious of the subconscious is no longer the subconscious. It becomes the conscious. So how yeah. do you study something that once you're aware of is no longer itself? Yes. Well, I can give you an answer to that. 
I'm open. What happens when you meditate and you relax and you allow yourself to not think? Does your mind go completely empty or does stuff keep jumping up on the screen? Oh, it's a fucking water faucet of what there the you go. Yeah. That's the unconscious. It's the storehouse of everything that rises up into the uh, into the conscious. So the, the ego mind, the thinking mind, when it relaxes, all of a sudden it sees there's this thing and people go, I can't stop my mind. Well, that's because minds are designed to think. The subconscious <laughs> is so creative, it created the fucking universe and you. You know, the conscious mind's only 5% of our consciousness. Most so give me that Xanax because I have anxiety and can't shut my mind off, right? So let me, yeah. let me numb it the fuck out. I say if you want to, you don't shut your mind off. You get, just get in the habit of not thinking that that's who you are and you witness it. I call it my dog. And I just say, okay, Robert, quit chasing fucking cars and come lay down with me in the sauna for a while, <laughs> you know? Or I just watch the show and just breathe into it. And you'll see that most of what's bubbling up from the unconscious is two things. The stuff that we're afraid of and we're repressing and our creative potentials that we're denying. Oh, and a mix of the two. Oh, yes, shit. Yes, because I'm, there are your two polarities without which nothing moves. Yeah, I've gotten deep like with the with dreams, right? I get kind of into it. And, yeah, uh, me too. Kind of my own interpretation, but never my own. I get anyway. I'll go left field. My point being is, I've often thought this is a, kind of a two point connection. I've often thought that the dreams that we have is the way the subconscious is communicating with the conscience, but the subconscious does not speak words English. It no, has symbols and words. images, right, to shape together to try to show you what the fuck is really happening or or yeah. will happen or could happen in some level, and to connect that with this. I don't. I pull, probably pull the theory from a bunch of other people I read. Is that really the brain isn't necessarily the generator of the thought but yet the receiver picking up on thought yes. waves that perhaps we can't see and imagine one day if we could create something as the way we see a light ray or the movement of light if we could slow down right if you could see the the thought wave for instance for lack of a better term that's floating all around and perhaps the deja vu that we experience is maybe that one moment in time where a thought that has happened we've caught up to the thought of an experience in life at that moment and go oh shit i've been here before when it's possibly someone else's thought that they have had at a moment in time that crosses with ours or some shit. Hey, if a thousand people turn on a radio in San Diego and turn it to 98.1, they'll all get KIFM. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> right. The brain is a two way radio system that's designed to receive the frequencies in which we communicate with nature and each other and the cosmos itself. Bentov shows that right in his book, Stalking the Wild Pendulum, very beautifully with graphs so you can see it. But you know, you're, you're, what you're saying is right. Uh, the, 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 the other thing I wanna point out is that we've got this fetish with the brain, but people forget the body and the brain cannot be functionally separated. The same fucking thing. Yes, look, if you study embryology, what you think of as your skin is actually brain tissue. It grows right out of the brain. Your whole brain is covering your fucking body. When you're getting a blow job, your brain goes crazy because you're getting a brain job. Touche, touche, yeah. yeah. Right, you know, you cut, you cut, you poke your finger Ow. with a tiny little pin, and your whole body goes, shit, that hurt. Yeah. And your brain goes, I don't like that. Right? Yeah. People, people love to compartmentalize stuff so they can territorialize it and say, I'm a heart specialist. Great I'm a fucking word. Specialist. Territorialize it. That is a great fucking word. You know, like they got the body broken up into fucking zip codes, but the reality of it is there is no zip codes. And that's what I found out when I started working in the field of medicine. It's like, what the hell is this? The physical therapists aren't allowed to do manipulation, and the chiropractors get pissed off, and the the doctors don't let you do this, and certain therapists are only allowed to touch the spine. And that's why I became a holistic health practitioner because by my license, by a California law, a holistic health practitioner can do anything that is done through natural means from herbs to playing in the mud to whatever. And they didn't know what to do with me because there was no laws saying that I couldn't touch this or couldn't touch that. So they were kind of mystified by this, you know, how, what do you do with a ninth guy, guy that's got a ninth grade education but seems to know more about you do than your own profession? Eventually change the law so you can't fucking do anything. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> well, you know, the, the, 
the, the good news is I've evolved myself to the point where I don't really do much of anything. I just teach everybody else how to do it for themselves. <laughs> Well, then you're helping more people at once doing so. You're probably more valuable sitting there training the others to go do more. Yeah, but, you know, just to kind of bring this to a wrap up, because I need to kind of, I got a three-year-old boy and I'm very pregnant uh, second wife at home. I, I told you we'd go four fucking hours, man. Dude, I've been digging this, man. You're fun. You know, we got to, we let's rock and roll again sometime because I'm all about this, you know. Anytime, and, man. If people are enjoying this, they should check out my podcast, which is Living 4D with Paul Check. So Living 4D with Paul, C-H-E-K. And I get in deep into the stuff like this. Like if you really want to have your mind blown, listen to my interview with Dr. Sherry Tenpenny on the real truth about vaccinations. That'll turn your head inside out. Yep. And many others. I mean, I got some great interviews and I'm running a series called Evolve Yourself 2019. So my first podcast was Evolve Yourself Physically. The second was Evolve Yourself Emotionally. The third was Evolve Yourself Mentally. And then just uh, yesterday, I think we released Evolve Yourself, or maybe this morning, Evolve Yourself Spiritually. And my last in the series is, is Evolve Your Career. So uh, each of those podcasts is about two and a half hours long. So even though you and I have talked about a fair bit, it only touches on what I share in the podcast. And the podcasts are only just a, a kind of a the the froth on the beer of being a Czech professional, which takes seven years to do. Yeah, I I certainly recommend it for people, most definitely. Uh, I mean, because too we it, we would take a week to even maybe go down the rabbit hole of a portion of a topic of four minutes of this podcast. Yeah, no, no, there. Yeah, it's deep stuff. You know, the human body and the human psyche is. It's the most complicated thing we've ever found in the entire universe. I mean, research shows that we have more neural connections in one person's brain than there are stars in the known universe, for God's sakes. Which are what? Damn near infinite. If Look, we, we have, have universe. Yeah, we, we, we have about 100 trillion cells in the human body. Each one of those cells is made of 100 trillion atoms. <laughs> motherfuckers can't even grasp that Paul. <laughs> for um, well, you know the thing is it's a lot of goddamn zeros right so you see there's zero again god loves to throw zeros around and create the illusion of material reality but really we're living in a virtual reality i tell people all the time if god is unconditional love the only numeral numer numerological symbol for that is zero because anything else is a condition <laughs> so then i ask my students this question if your mother is a zero are you a one or a virtual one? Hmm. I guess a virtual one. You're a virtual one. So this is the game God plays, but God does it so, with such great intensity, you can't tell that it's all a virtual reality. And I'll tell you what, one good hit of DMT will take you right out of that <laughs> show to show you what's really going on. And I'm, I'm not encouraging that for people. Don't be running around playing with that. I've known six people to die on DMT already. Holy shit. But the point is, sometimes you have to be really ready to die to figure out what life's all about. And that's what people are doing. They're dying very slowly. They're just doing a lousy job of it. <laughs> Jung said, no man is fully alive until he has the power to destroy himself. And here we are. We've got the power to destroy ourselves. We do it with sugar. We do it with cars. We do it with guns. We do it with electromagnetic pollution. We do it with military technology. You know, we, we are constantly on the edge of destroying ourselves. The challenge is realizing that living and loving negates the need to destroy yourself. Mm. You see, we all know we're really alive when we wake up from a coma and go, oh, my God, what happened? Oh, you were in a car accident and, and you almost died. And I'm sorry to announce that your wife and your kids are dead. Oh. Well, there you had the power to destroy yourself. And now you're alive, but you were unconscious. What I'm saying is we're acting unconsciously with very powerful foods, drugs, weapons, tools and gadgets because we're not conscious to realize that we're using more death force than we are the life force and if we don't wake up together we're going to destroy ourselves and i'll close with this very potent comment from rudolf steiner who is a genius in many levels steiner said 
And he said this in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He said, man will continue to invent advanced technologies until one of two things happens. He either destroys the world or realizes that everything he's invented outside of himself is only a replica of a technology that already exists within himself. Yes, yes, I love that. And that's the fact. Brother, that is a sick, serious, beautiful, direct way to wrap up this Cognitive Rampage, brother. This has been a fucking pleasure, Paul. Thank you. Uh, I've enjoyed it, too. I mean, anytime you're with an atom, you know you're right down to the core of everything. Right down from the earth, baby. Right from the muddy, slippery fucking earth, baby. And and my name, Paul, means the messenger. <laughs> well, you have certainly brought the message today, man, and a lot, dude. Thank you uh, again, Paul, for coming on, man. Get back to the fam. Uh, enjoy it, Paul. Thanks for sharing here, everybody, man. Go listen to man's podcast, uh, buy the books, follow him, get in a, get, just get into it, Paul. Thanks, man. Anytime you want to come back, brother, uh, I'd love to have you back every fucking week, man. So Yeah, just uh, touch base with Penny anytime you're up for it. And if you want, I can get you on my podcast sometime too. Um, my website, for the Czech Institute, is chekinstitute.com. And then my program for personal, professional, spiritual success mastery is ppssuccess.com, which is also housed at the Czech Institute. My YouTube channel, with which has over 500 videos going into everything from exercise to emotions to, you know, I've been doing video blogs. A lot of them are like an hour plus long. They're not sound bites. It's not edutainment. It's the real deal. And that's youtube.com forward slash Paul Check Live. And my blog is paulchecksblog.com damn right brother i appreciate you putting out there i love to be on the show too anytime man just uh tell me when i kind of like the tombstone line say when yes um, you've uh, penny's got your email so let's touch base have you uh, seen my book how to eat move and be healthy for sure uh oh, that good. that book gets passed around we have a uh, a closed group it's called the tribe of change on facebook where this these are most of the people that have pointed you uh in my direction for many a many a moon now uh, good. Well, tell them i said thank you for the love oh they certainly just saw that man so i certainly will man the, the tribe loves you i'm so glad i got to get you on and share some of this man and is this uh interview we've just done does it stay up on YouTube or where is it? Can people access it after this? Yeah, we're live right now. So we, we've been live on this one. So live the whole time. It's on YouTube, Cognitive Rampage. Uh, that's where we house a lot of the videos. It's not where we pull a lot of our, our viewing. Uh, but we'll go from here where it will go on Facebook and then iTunes. I'll load it up tomorrow. Um, and Steve will do some fixing, you know, intros and stuff like that. And uh, it'll be up on iTunes tomorrow. Can you email Penny Link so that we can share it with our uh network yeah most definitely uh when we post it on facebook i can i'll tag uh everything you are on that too every page everything you got we'll tag that and uh itunes is where we do the killer man we're uh number 10 in alternative health podcast well hopefully you'll go to number one i know we will now after you've been on here brother <laughs> drop well, you know i look i i just want to make sure everybody knows it's not my intention to offend any offend anybody i can only tell the truth as i know it that's that's all any of us can do I'm just sharing the product of my life experience, but I have spent my life honestly and intensely studying and researching. I've worked with thousands of people's problems and major organizations all over the world, and they wouldn't hire me if I didn't get results. And really, it boils down to the, really, you can boil it down to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Brother, man, I appreciate the work. I know there are thousands out there that are thanking you for helping them in their lives, man, and, and the impact you've made. Your study is not in vain, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people have improved their lives and still are today from what you're doing, man. I've improved just sitting here listening with you and chatting with you, buddy. Well, thanks for giving me the chance to share. You know, love is a relationship. I define love as the flow of energy and information through empathic and compassionate connection to self and or other. So, We've all been sharing love today. Oh, brother. Well, I'll, I'll leave you with this one. Love you, brother. Love you too, partners. Keep it up. Let's uh, do our best to uh, be the elders that give some honest guidance to the young people that are lost in the world or the old young people that need to grow up. <laughs> Doing the best we can, man. 
Thanks yeah. again, brother. Be good. Tell the family and everybody said hi until we chat again, man. Thank you for the cognitive rampage, man. A uh, whole great spirit. Holla. It is done. It is done. It is done. Blessings, man. See you, bud.